Let's call to order, please, the meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Passing City College. Um, roll call, please, Ms. Thompson. Excuse me, it's here. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Here. Mr. Baum. Here. Mr. Martin. Here. Ms. Brown. Here. Dr. Fellow. Here. Dr. Mann. Present. Ms. Wall. Present. Mr. Peck. Here. Skin of his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there anyone who wishes to address the board on any of the closed agenda items? Public comment on any of those items? Okay. Um, first, I have uh, from Glenna Watterson. Um, Can you stay out of trouble? <laughs> but, <laughs> Dear Board of Trustees, my name is Glenna Watterson, and I am speaking you, to you tonight under the guise of past president of ISSUE. During the four years I was president, I was visited numerous times by many staff members from a particular area. They came to me with serious issues concerning their manager. They were issues of harassment, mostly of a sexual nature. I will spare you from the horrific details, but I will tell you that no PCC employee, classified or otherwise, should be subjected to such treatment, often on a daily basis. This was a well-known problem in the area. In fact, so many people on campus knew there was a problem. It was almost a joke, only it wasn't very funny. This manager's harassment was a catalyst for so many people quitting, retiring early, transferring out to other areas, or just plain getting fired. It shouldn't have taken HR or the VP so long to realize and address this problem. I believe that this manager's intimidating ways was key to employees not wanting to come forward with a formal grievance. Issue was finally able to convince a portion of the affected employees to band together and file a formal grievance. When the investigation began and the improprieties started coming to light, the district could see that this was indeed a serious matter. So measures were taken on the part of the district to distance this person from the employees. One cannot but think, help but think should a classified member have acted so illegally towards their coworkers or other employees, swift action would have been taken to protect those being targeted. Not so in this area. These employees, many of them here for decades with wonderful work ethics and reputations, had to tolerate the intolerable for years. The district is still fussing around this. There's been no closure or resolution for the employees who I am telling you have been traumatized by the events over the past few years. Just the fact that this person is no longer on campus is not enough. Our understanding is this manager will now be offered the retirement incentive. A year off with full pay and retirement incentive? Nothing punitive at all? That sends a message of, we don't care about you, to the employees. What a sad state of affairs. I am sorely disappointed in the management of this situation by the district. And this is a district that I've loved and been loyal to for 35 years. Do your job. Okay, the next is uh, Anna Mae Jones. <clears throat> Thank you, President Thompson, board members, Dr. Rocha, my name is Anna Mae Jones. I'm a secretary in college advancement. I'm also the current president of ISSUE. I have some written remarks I'd like to read at this time. It is with a heavy heart that I am compelled to stand before you this evening and ask for your assistance in bringing a very troubling matter involving allegations of sexual harassment to a resolution which not only recognizes the gravity of the situation, but also the enormity of the harm our unit members have suffered. Last evening, after absolutely no communication from district council on this matter since April 3, Issues Council received two emails in the span of six hours. Tonight, I want to focus my remarks on the second of these emails. First, district council stated, quote, the complainants received an administrative determination on March 10 and did not appeal from it. That statement is false. On March 16th, in the absence of both administrative support personnel in the president's office, I hand delivered to Dr. Van Pelt's administrative assistant letters of appeal from each of the affected issue unit members. They were time stamped with a copy returned to me. Thereafter, I personally saw them placed in a file of pending matters which I was informed would subsequently be given to staff in the president's office. I hope you will concur with me that there should be no question 
whether our unit members' appeals were timely received by the district. Second district council went on to state, quote, the complainants have received all the relief they ever sought. In fact, the complainants, as opposed to the issue leadership, appear to be quite satisfied, end quote. Council, I want to ask you, whom did you speak to in order to arrive at that conclusion? I think I can safely say the answer is not any of our aggrieved unit members. This afternoon, I personally spoke with six of the seven grievance, one is out of the office, and can inform you with no equivocation that to a person they are not satisfied with the district's response. The egregious and unlawful behavior at issue herein was suffered by our issue unit members for several years before last summer. During that same preceding time frame, multiple attempts asking for the district's intervention to compel a cessation in the unlawful behavior were also made. For various reasons, each of these cries for help were ignored or disregarded by the district. It was only after all of our unit members, with the guidance of my predecessor as issue president, Glenna Watterson, they courageously banded together and as a collective group simultaneously filed their grievances, that the district finally realized that perhaps there was credence to the complaints and began a course of purported corrective action that remains unfinished to this day. To know that the alleged perpetrator has continued to be fully paid for the past 11 months does not, I can assure you, bring comfort or closure or to use district council's choice of word, satisfaction to our unit members. As the duly elected president of this bargaining unit, I take particular exception to district council's intimation that the issue leadership is the only dissatisfied party. Despite that suggestion, I and my colleagues on the issue board remain firm in our resolve and distinctly undeterred in vigorously representing and protecting our members at every opportunity. <clears throat> issue considers this matter to be one of the most important it has faced in its 20 year history of existence. Thus, Board of Trustee members, I now stand before you as issue president and respectfully, but with all due urgency, ask that you direct the administration and your legal counsel to forthwith bring this matter to a conclusion which acknowledges and fully respects the issue bargaining unit, as well as the enormous harm suffered by our affected unit members. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else to address the board on the closed session items? Um, Ms. Dowell, would you have a response? Not, not in public session, thank you. Okay. Then uh, no one else appearing, we will adjourn to closed session to have a Address Government uh, Code Section 54956.9B1, Conference of Legal Counsel Regarding Anticipated Litigation, one case. Government Code Section 54957, Employee Discipline, Dismissal, Release, five employees. Government Code Section 54957.6, Collective Bargaining, PCCFA, CSEA 777, ISSU, POA, Designated Negotiator, Mr. Engeldinger. <laughs> Government Code Section 54957.6, Negotiation with Unrepresented Employees, Confidentials, Management Association, again the designated negotiator, Mr. Engeldinger, and we shall return um, after the closed session at 6 o'clock. The board is back in open session. Uh, there is no reportable action from the closed session. Uh, so we will now begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, Dr. Douglas, would you lead that us in that, please? My pleasure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item we have on the agenda is the approval of minutes. The um, meeting number eight, the joint meeting with Associated Students on April the 6th, um, 2011. Um, also number nine, the study session in Temple City, April 20th, 2011. And meeting number 10, joint meeting with the Pasadena Divided School District, 
on May the 3rd of this year. Other uh, questions, um, corrections, comments about the, Mr. Pack? Uh, just one change to the April 6th uh, minutes on page three uh, under item E number one. Uh, the Vice President for Public Relations, uh, her name is, is listed as Chelsea Pack. It's actually Chesley, C H E S L E A Pack. Okay. Other uh, corrections? Uh, Questions or comments? Uh, Dr. Mann? I think in the, um, uh, just a second, the, I wasn't seeing, where's the joint meeting with the school board? Did you say those minutes were here? Yeah. I didn't see the minutes either. I was going to raise the same They're point. There's the agenda is there, but. Uh, it's right here. Where? It's where? Uh, the fourth page, and it says call to order. The meeting was called to order at 6.12 p.m. by Renata Cooper. Uh, the fourth page. The back. So go, go to the very back. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. And it says meeting number yeah. 10. Oh. Okay. Who prepared the minutes? You did? Okay. <laughs> A little different uh, format. Oh, then, then I still have the same comment. I, I think since Dr. Rosser was there and stayed through the whole meeting and did make a comment that we might want to make a comment on that. We should add that uh, to the. I would like to. I would like to make that as a under, uh, maybe under audience participation. Dr. Jim Rosser, President of Cal State LA, uh, uh, commented on the uh, commented very favorably on the two plus two program and <laughs> pledged his support to making sure the students had the programs and for the final two years. Something to that effect. Any objection to adding that to the minutes? Okay. Other comments, questions? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. All three sets? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. And moved and seconded to approve the minutes of all three meetings. Um, all student advisory vote? Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, now back to introduction of guests. Are there any guests to be introduced? I think we're, I think we're okay. Okay. Announcements and recognitions. Uh, Board of Trustees. Any comments? No. Uh, uh, Mr. Baum. Just a couple of quick ones. The um, first off, uh, in the community, uh, both uh, uh, Trustee Brown and I attended the annual celebration for the program at out of Muir High School, the mentoring program for youth development and. It was a community-wide celebration of the work that uh, is being done to support uh, young men in our, in our district, and I was proud to be a part of that. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Rocha for joining me Monday night at a community meeting in La Cunada for the uh, La Cunada Republican Committee to talk about Pasadena City College and uh, in the service that PCC is providing the community. We also uh, signed up a few uh, 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 high school and college students to uh, to attend PCC this summer and in the fall. Um, finally, we had a uh, community college's Board of Governors meeting last Monday. It was an extensive agenda, and, and Dr. Mann was up in Sacramento to represent the Community College League. We, it was, um, uh, there was a, a lot of discussion about legislation that we'll, we'll get into later, but uh, there's a, a movement to provide districts some flexibility with rates for uh, credit courses, uh, uh, bills going through uh, the legislature on that. We, we have not taken a position on that, but, uh, but it's about uh, extension programs or continuing ed programs being able to charge market rates for credit courses. And uh, we're, we're listening to uh, uh, feedback on, on how to, what, what, what we should do about that. And obviously the, uh, the other big issue that we have to uh, uh, think about is the budget and the government governor passed uh, presenters may revise and how the system wide we're going to handle that and I know we're getting a uh, presentation on that uh, for PCC specifically later um, but um, if anybody has any questions about what happened at the Board of Governors meeting happy to share other uh, Ms. Wong yeah I just wanted to comment that um, Trustee Brown and I had a chance to attend the uh, Latino and the black um, scholarship breakfasts and it was really great to hear um, the awardees and their stories. 
Um, the other thing is I had a chance this, uh, earlier this week to attend or to see the, um, I guess, visit the Vocational Ed Construction Program right. under Rich Thank Wheeler, you. and that was really great. And I think that it gives us a, it was really great to see not only there are women in the, the program, which I thought was, was great, but um, it gives us an opportunity, I think, when we look at um, how we focus our students on what's available in the industry, but also the integration of what we have in academics, such as architecture, engineering, um, CAD, into that program. So, great program. Dr. Fellow? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I just um, wanted to mention that um, I was very impressed with um, uh, the PCC Foundation reception last Friday in the, pr in the um, instructors that um, teachers, professors who won grants, and that was attended by the President Thompson and Trustees Hua and uh, Brown and myself, and uh, I think Dr. Sugimoto, you did a very good job, and, and certainly with your leadership, we were able to give these grants to these deserving faculty. Thank you. Dr. Mann? Yes, I, I just wanted to say I, I am on the Student Success Task Force, and uh, we met at the same, actually the same day of the second day of the Board of Governors meeting. And one of the things that was discussed the Board of Governors at a first reading was reducing the number of times a student could repeat a course. Yes. And one of the things that the Student Success Task Force is looking at is these very issues of uh, <coughs> reducing the number of times students can pass a course, requiring students to go to orientation. Uh, there is a, 20 colleges called the Golden Triangle, pardon me, 20 states called the Golden Triangle, all of whom have very high completion rates in community college students. And they are, as we were given an analysis of what characteristics they all share in common. And that was, that was one of them. So there's about 20 characteristics of the Golden Triangle. California as a, as a community, you know, as a state, is so far away from any of them that we would never make the golden triangle, but individual campuses could uh, look at uh, look at some of these things. Good. Other comments? Um, the uh, I'm sorry. I forgot. The one thing I wanted to add is that PCC is the talk of Sacramento <coughs> right now because this was on the heels of our our gift announcement, and everybody in the system wide is taking notice of uh, of that and and excited for Pasadena City College and what it means for. Uh, the system to see such major philanthropic focus on community colleges and also there's a lot of buzz about all the positions we have open yes. and some people inquiring about uh, if they can uh, apply for jobs at Pasadena City College. They're very excited about that. Of course you said yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Anybody can apply. Um, I just wanted to end the um, May-June 2011 issue of the Pasadena Arts Council of Folio there is a recognition of um, Dean Alex Chrysellis uh, and also um, um, a person named Joey Forsyth, a filmmaker. Um, and they have uh, received uh, an award to propose Picasso's Dilemma Public Art Installation. And uh, quite a nice article about uh, Dean Chrysellis and uh, Ms. Uh, Forsyth. And so I encourage all of you to read that. And we should make sure that uh, he receives appropriate uh, recognition. Uh, from us uh, and everything. So, um, Mr. Uh, Superintendent President Rocha. Thank you, President Thompson. I just have a, a you know a couple of quick ones before I go on to the three that are uh, listed there. There are two really significant events uh, that had to do with uh, raising money for scholarships besides the Westerbeck. Uh, last uh, Thursday was, and I see uh, Dean Olivo here had a wonderful the President's Latino Advisory. Uh, group sponsors uh, the Latino um, Scholarship Awards, and we had a wonderful event there and gave out uh, how many scholarships did we give out? Twelve one thousand dollars scholarships, and so uh, the uh, I, I really want to thank uh, Cynthia and all the uh, wonderful people who are on the uh, Latino Advisory Committee that make that possible. And then this morning, wanted to thank uh, Trustee Wa and Trustee uh, Brown. We had a wonderful event by um, the Association of Black Employees and their annual um, scholarship uh, breakfast, although it, it was starting to get to be a scholarship lunch. And, uh, <laughs> and again, I, I say, um, I don't have the program in front of me, but we awarded about 15 
scholarships to both uh, CEC and workforce and uh, regular transfer students, and it was uh, a wonderful event. And again, I wanted to thank the uh, President's African American Advisory Committee for and the uh, TABE, the Association of Black Employees, for making that possible. It was a great event, great speakers. Uh, let me move on, uh, if, uh, if I may, to uh, three recognitions I wanted to uh, briefly call out, and I'll ask uh, Vice President Van Pelt to uh, explain uh, these two sustainability awards we recently won. Thank you. Uh, last week, we were notified that the California Higher Education Sustainability Conference, oh, good. which will be held in July, uh, PCC is going to receive two best practice awards. The first one is an innovation waste reduction, which is basically our recycling program and diversion from landfill. And the uh, other winners in that category were UC Davis and CSU Chico. And the second award is for the Campus and Community Partnership Award. Uh, which will be highlighted in the social equity tract, and that deals with the, um, uh, the I-PASS program of providing uh, alternative transportation through social equity. Um, the third one, actually, is that while we didn't win the award for water conservation, they do want us to do a presentation because our efforts are, are still leading uh, the field. And so uh, we're, we'll be doing three presentations at the Cal State Long Beach um, campus uh, July 10th through the 14th. Good. And we won in two categories, and this included not just community colleges, but uh, the other public colleges. It, they awarded in each category to the University of California, to CSU, and to a community college. All right. Great. Uh, congratulations, Rick, and thank you to all the staff, uh, students who have been uh, working on the sustainability uh, goal for the campus. Um, and okay, uh, let's see, we have some great uh, fashion students that we wanted to uh, uh, shout out to. Let me see. Uh, it's our fashion. Uh, oh, what, come on. They're not here. Oh, okay. <laughs> they thought the meeting started at 7. Okay, well, well, we'll dovetail them then, but I do see our architecture people. So come on up and uh, if you would just briefly uh, tell the board. The great, great program, great awards the, our architecture students won this past uh, weekend. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, an honor to be here to speak with you. Um, we had a kind of a, a rather First of all, large. Tell us who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Coleman Griffith. I'm the coordinator of the architecture department at Pasadena City College. And this is Gabriela Comanares. Gabriela is the recipient of a second place uh, scholarship award by the American Institute of Architects. She was in a, a juried competition by architects in Los Angeles uh, who awarded her this place. Uh, her field of competition were university uh, students and graduate students in architecture. She, uh, she competed against fifth year professional degree program students and graduate students. The first place went to two students who uh, were with a master's project from UCLA, Gabriela from Architecture 20B at Pasadena City College came in second. The, this is not the first time this has happened, so this is not just luck. This is the second, year, to second time in two years, and to be honest with you, I think we should have won last year as well. <laughs> um, this is Gabriella's uh, uh, board. Um, the project that, uh, that was uh, submitted this year uh, by Gabriella uh, is what we call Places of Performance. Um, it, is a, it was a, a project, a hypothetical project that proposes uh, the introduction of performance spaces, chamber music performance spaces within the Los Angeles Grand Central Market. It, the idea, the challenge that I gave my students in the second year was to reinvent the relationship between the orchestra and the community. And so by doing, by having this particular <laughs> 
sort of scheme uh, at the market. They were able to sort of juxtapose uh, two very sort of unlikely uh, activities, but in a way that provoked a rather interesting synergy between the two programs. So I'd like to turn this over to Gabriella for a moment, and maybe she can talk about it. Um, hi, I'm Gabriella. Uh, so basically, the whole process um, started really simply by um, promoting classical music into the community, especially in downtown LA. Um, and it was a beautiful experience. Um, and the whole exhibition, it was, I mean, a, definitely a, a prestigious exhibition. And I was so glad that I was part of it in the first place. But I was even more excited when I got um, to second place. So yeah, the whole process, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriella's success will continue. She has a scholarship to go to Woodbury University, mm -hmm. where her the remaining uh, three years of her education for her professional degree in architecture will be a uh, half of that will be paid for by this scholarship. That's great. So Wonderful. of her com total expense, which is a significant <clears throat> sum today. So um, so we're very proud of her, and um, and and honored to be here before you to talk about this because you know this is what we are trying to do yeah. help to contribute to the success of what makes a global community college it's it's the efforts of these students that will project beyond our borders to other places and so forth so thank you very much I just, I just Mr. question for Gab uh, did you come to PCC plan, uh, with the goal to study architecture how did that come about? I did have in mind, um, architecture was always been in the back of my head. I did take um, graphic design and uh, engineering classes as well. And it wasn't until I took the first class of introduction of architecture when I decided, okay, yeah, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I knew from the beginning that Pasadena City College is so um, popular with, with their uh, architecture design uh, program. It's supposed to be one of the best in LA or even in California. So, and this is one of, one of the reasons why I came over here, because everybody talks about it all the time, so. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Martin? Did you receive any inspiration on, from your work from the common areas of our parking structures yes. where we play costumes? <laughs> <laughs> parking structures? <laughs> yeah, it was all about that. <laughs> <laughs> you just made my day. already a professional diplomat. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. It shows what a great educational experience you've had at Pasadena City College. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> great. Well, congratulations to you, and thank you very much That's for great. what's thank a so wonderful much. contribution. So we really appreciate that. Great. Good luck to you. Thank you. Great. Congratulations. <laughs> so in, in closing, um, this is an example of um, this for PCC is a common example. It is, it, Gabriella is exceptional but we have many exceptional students with exceptional outcomes. It's one of the reasons why we say that excellence is an equity issue. We're, we're one of the few community colleges left that uh, has retained this. Um, and I remember the first day I walked into Coleman's class, he invited me into his class, and uh, Coleman is, uh, leads a group of uh, faculty that you see their work and you see their uh, students working together. Uh, it's absolutely at the state of the art, and we're, we're very, very proud and grateful, and congratulations. So. Good. Okay, uh, we are at the point of shared governance reports. Oh, your fa fashion people are here. Oh, the fashion. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, very good. <laughs> right on cue. You, fashion you almost lost awards. your spot. <laughs> you are on. We are so delighted to have you so that you can tell us about this uh, great, great award. Excellent. Uh, my name is Sunny Cannon. I am uh, the newest faculty in the fashion design department here at PCC. Um, and I wanted to tell you about some really exciting news that we've had lately. Um, on April 16th, um, at the California Market Center down in downtown LA. Um, the California Community College's Family and Consumer Sciences um, organization hosted a fashion symposium where students from across the state gathered to meet industry professionals to learn about combining their talents and created, uh, creativity with sustainable fashion practices. So at this symposium, our students at PCC 
had the opportunity to compete statewide against 37 other community colleges that offer fashion programs. Um, there were more than 100 semi-finalist garments that were showcased in a um, uh, fashion show that was the capstone of this symposium. Um, they, it was uh, the culmination of this gigantic event. Um, so I'm really happy to announce that four of our students were um, chosen as semi-finalists, and not only that, but we won a best in show, we won a first place, a second place, and an honorable mention. So I'd like to introduce them to you now, because we just were so excited and we absolutely want to show them off to you. Okay, so Lawrence Wu, right here? Where is your model? Come on. Okay, so Lawrence um, won an honorable mention in the sportswear category for his lace hey, shorts. Come do a, a catwalk for us. You <laughs> <laughs> these, these are all student models, and they didn't know they'd be walking. So, <laughs> um, so he won an honorable mention for this lace short and sweatshirt ensemble. He won... Um, a, Okay, sorry, he'll be uh, completing his fashion design certificate this fall, and he plans on transferring to Woodbury. Um, he had an, um, a wonderful internship opportunity last year, and they loved him so much, they hired him the second his internship was over. So he's now not an intern, but he's an associate designer at a great big juniors company, mm -hmm. and some of his designs are going to be shown to um, a store called BB this week. So we're pulling for him to get his designs actually in a store. Um, next up, Nancy Kwan. Nancy won second place for her convertible trench coat. Where are you? Trench coat? Cool. <laughs> Ooh, that's she won nice. second place for her convertible oh, her? trench coat dress in the sportswear nice. category. Um, she also had some other honorable mention dresses. Come on, take the walk. She won $200 and some online classes. Uh, Nancy will be earning her fashionist certificate this fall. She already has a BA in communications from UC San Diego and she was working at LA Unified as um, a uh, supplies buyer, I guess, when the layoffs hit. So she decided to just take a totally different career path, and she said that since changing her um, goals, she has never felt more purposeful and fulfilled. Okay, oh, Excel. There's Excel. Uh, she was a semi-finalist in both the sportswear and a project redesign <laughs> category. She ended up winning first place for her redesign um, project, and this dress was actually re repurposed out of several men's um, basic dress shirts, shirts yeah. um, which is just really exciting. Um, she won $250 and a professional dress form and some online classes as well. Uh, Excel is shooting for the stars, and she's planning on finishing next fall with not one, but all of our certificates that we're offering. Um, she has a BA in fine arts already, but when she had the opportunity for several freelance jobs, she need, knew she needed some more design experience, and so she decided to come to PCC. Um, not only does she create um, the designs by drawing them and creating line sheets, but she's also um, doing some freelance for other people recreating things. Uh, her most recent project is um, trying to remake a wedding dress that somebody chopped up when she got mad at her husband. <laughs> so she's, <laughs> she's got her hands full. Um, so on top of her amazing work as a student at PCC, she also runs a local fine arts school called Art Lyceum. So we are really excited and happy to have her with us. Okay, last but not least, Nancy Dipp. She won Best in Show and $500 for her presentation boards. There were several presentation board categories. People had to research um, historical and cultural design influences and costume history and quality comparison and design, but hers was best out of all of them. So she got a special award for her design presentation boards. Nice. So she not only made the clothes, photographed them, illustrated them, did technical design specifications, and definitely deserved her Best in Show award. So we're super proud of her. Um, I would just like just to say how excited I am for these students, and I wanted to um, ba -ba 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 -ba, congratulate them and ask you to join us in congratulating them.
much for your time, and I hope that when you're shopping someday, you'll see their beautiful work, and hopefully you'll be buying it too. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Very well done. Shared governance reports now, I believe. Ms. Hammond? AS elections are underway right now until midnight tonight, and so as of Friday, you should know who the incoming executive board will be, but you'll hear about them at the next meeting. Okay. Ms. Albright? Um, yesterday was classified day. I would like to thank Dr. Rocha for doing his little numbers that he did in the morning session and in the afternoon <laughs> session. <laughs> um, I also would like to thank the Academic Senate and Human Resources for giving of their, uh, we had giveaways and the Academic Senate and HR were just absolutely wonderful on donating. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Douglas and Lynn Wright for their contribute. They contributed to the leadership uh, speaker, which was Peter Paris. Oh, I'm sorry, Garnon from the Paris group. And it was very well received. All classified that joined, we had I think a total of 97, 47 in the morning and the rest in the afternoon. We had yoga session and it was very well received. I think it was the first classified Senate, classified day that was, had nothing but positive. There was hardly any negativity whatsoever. It was very well received. June 1st also is the general session for the classified where we will be giving out a student scholarship and also a classified uh, scholarship for the employees that are continuing their education. And our elections are also coming up for June 1st. Good, thank you. Thank Ms. You. Martinez? Uh, you have a copy of the uh, San Senate nanoseconds uh, in front of you, so I just wanted to point out a, a few items. Uh, the very first one, uh, we have some good news coming to you soon. Uh, we are on the verge of approving a distance education <coughs> policy. Uh, this has been in the works for a, a couple of years now, uh, but we want to make sure that all of the various constituencies have had their input and that the issues have been aired and that we have a good a uh, viable document to present to you uh, very soon. The other item that I want to mention uh, are the uh, SASI Innovation Awards, the Student Access and Student uh, Initiative Innovation Awards. We had a presentation by Lynn Wright this past week just announcing to the faculty the, uh, the nature of the various awards that have been made and the amounts. And just to give you, uh, you may be receiving more information about this later, but just to give you sort of a, an overview, uh, there was an award to Salomon Davila and Deborah Bird from uh, Engineering and Architecture on Design Technology Pathway, a Pre-Health Sciences Pathway led by Paul Jarrell and Katie Rodriguez, um, a Lecture Capture Technology uh, led by um, Leslie Terrapelli uh, related to distance education, and a number of other um, mini grant awards that were um, uh, announced by Lynn Wright and she as the chair of the Senate's professional development committee will coordinate the dissemination of information about these projects to make sure that this is indeed, uh, that there is indeed ongoing innovation and that faculty have the opportunity to share their ideas uh, and engage in, in innovation. And then the third thing that I want to bring to your attention, you have a copy of this announcement also. Tomorrow we have uh, the annual uh, Faculty Lecturer Performance Award, a presentation by Dr. Tuk Tuk Thong uh, Tiraj, an Associate Professor of English. She will be talking about pop culture in the classroom under the title Gaga, Garnett, and Gucci in the classroom. So I'll have to find out what that's about tomorrow. But you're invited at 12 noon in C333 and the reception following in C217. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Douglas? Yeah, I'd just like to remind everyone we're going to have our annual retirement breakfast on June 16th at 7 a.m. at Brookside. And I'd like to invite uh, any of the board members who'd like to come. We expect a good turnout this year. So. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Colross? No report. Mr. Miller? Uh, just to uh, echo a little bit of what President Martinez said, and at the next board meeting, we'll have a full report on the SASI uh, allocations and, and the funding. This, uh, tonight's agenda was very full, so we decided to put it off to the June 1st meeting. Okay. Mr. Pack? Uh, no reports. Okay, Ms. Chapman? Thank you. No report this evening. Mr. Engeldinger? No report. Dr. Sugimoto? 
And just to thank the board members who attended the Academic Excellence Mini Grants and Grants Reception, really appreciate your presence and the congratulations to the faculty. I also wanted to recognize Shirley Burt, who's in the audience and is one of our stalwart foundation board members and is always present. So thank you, Shirley, for being here. Mr. Wil or Dr. Wilcox? Uh, just two items, just to let you know that tomorrow evening is uh, the spring general scholarship uh, awards dinner, and the following evening is the flea market scholarship awards dinner. <laughs> Where will those be held? <laughs> right here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Van Pelt? No report. Okay. Um, I guess we are at the point of uh, public comment on non-agenda items. We have a uh, request to speak from first Nicholas Smith. My name is Nicholas Smith. Um, as uh, Edward Martinez kind of pointed out, uh, this past Monday, um, one of the topics that was discussed at the Academic Senate was time, place, and manner. Um, it's on the nanoseconds, I believe. Um, but uh, it went to discussion to the entire board, and in that discussion it was brought up that there's some confusion over the original document that was, um, that this, that this uh, piece of litigation has been uh, being debated over, I guess. Um, I guess it was, uh, some people think that it's a mandate by a court. Other people say that it's not a mandate. Um, after everything was discussed and it was decided to uh, once again take a look at time, place, and manner, uh, I approached Edward Martinez after the meeting and I asked him if it was possible if I could get a copy of this document. Um, he said that he wasn't able to provide it for me, um, but he did say that possibly the Board of Trustees was able to get it for me. So I'm here tonight to re officially request a copy of the document um, under the California um, Public Records Act. But by document, you mean what? Well, it's unsure. No one really knows like, what it is. Um, some people say that it was uh, a court order. Some people say no. that it wasn't. We can... Just, uh, Why don't we turn to counsel. Um, I appreciate your comment. Uh, maybe general counsel can be helpful because we, uh, uh, counsel has perhaps some context uh, that would be helpful here. Because uh, there has been this issue that you raised about court order, no court order. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think counsel, counsel might be able to help us out here. I'm, I want to try to be as succinct as possible, um, Mr. Thompson, members of the board. Dr. Rocha, members of the audience. Uh, first of all, to my knowledge, there has never been a court order okay. issued that required the Board of Trustees or the college to revise its time, place, and manner regulations. I think that misconception arose because a number of years ago, in response to some complaints that were raised uh, by students and staff, um, an investigation occurred which led to some recommendations being forwarded to the Board of Trustees by a retired Superior Court judge who at that time and still is a professional mediator and uh, alternative dispute resolution expert. And one of the recommendations that he made to the Board was that they revisit and update their time, place, and manner regulations. But because he is a retired judge, he was referred to quite often as the judge. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how the uh, misconception arose that there was some kind of judicial order. Would it be possible for myself to get a copy of that recommendation then? I am honestly not sure that there's a written recommendation that could be produced. Uh, but I do know that he made that recommendation to the board. If there's, if, if there's a disclosable document in existence still that can be produced, then we can look for it and, and look at that. Um, it may well be that there is not, but we can look for that. Well, we must have something, though, that goes back and discloses There'll be, there'll be some record in the board's records, for sure. Yes, and I think uh, that's what he would like to have, and I think we certainly should uh, provide it uh, to If nothing them. else, we, we'll be able to find something in the board's minutes. Can you take about two minutes to give us the background of this? How do we get a mediator involved and what led to this? 
Well, there, there may be people in the room who can tell the story better than I can, but to the best of my recollection, and there, there will be a few board members still, I think, who, who will recall it. Um, and at the time that the Iraq war began, uh, there were some protests and demonstrations on campus, and they spilled into the administration building from the areas outside. Uh, where a great many people were, were engaged in um, expressive activity uh, in opposition to the war. Uh, once this uh, got into the interior of the building, uh, the campus police became involved and there were later allegations of misconduct by the police. And it was in the course of doing investigations of those allegations of misconduct by the police, which were personnel investigations, uh, they were protected, uh, the, the police were all provided with the protections under the Peace Officers Bill of Rights and, and they were very carefully done. Um, but the, uh, the judge was asked to review the results of that personnel investigation uh, in order to assure that there was a very neutral individual uh, involved in it. Um, and so, it was in the course of then reporting back to the board uh, after that personnel investigation that these recommendations were made. Okay. Mr. So, Mr. Baum, you were, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, in, just in my understanding then, because the police um, allegedly conducted or were misconducting themselves, the students were then therefore, or the campus was therefore then decided that they needed to have stronger time, place, and manner? The recommendation was that there be clearer time, place, and manner rec regulations, right. yes. And I, I'm, I know that Mr. Martin and Dr. I'm, Mann were on the board at the time. I think you did a great job yeah. of summing it up. I think in the context of the, uh, there were several subsets of this. One is when the riots moved indoors and you had students in classrooms. I know the history, yeah. 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 Oh, okay, I thought you were asking for the history. No, so I, no, the point I, I was trying to make is that I think the judge was saying you needed time, place, and manner so there was a way to express, for people to express themselves so that other students still felt safe. Yeah. And I That's think right. that in part was the impetus behind it to carefully balance both the academic um, expression with academic safety. Okay. All right. Well, I would still like to see, um, see the recommend, original what, recommendation. If, if we, we, I mean, the, at this point, I can't say for certain what disclosable documents there may be that we could produce, but we certainly can. Well, there, must, there has to be that. something that has the recommendations right. embodied in a piece of and paper, and we'll that. get that to you. So. All right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Uh, the next request we have is from Ahmad Kazfi, K-A-S-F-Y. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Hello, it's pronounced uh, Ahmad Kasfi. Ahmad Kas Kasfi. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. All right. <clears throat> I come to speak to you this evening in order to inform you about a cruel brand of injustice that is developing on campus. Yesterday at about 4 o'clock, an anonymous individual torched the Holy Quran and threw it off the R building here on campus. I was on the other side of the R building when this event took place, and, it did not, and I did not see the burning of the Holy Quran with my own eyes but I saw where campus police put out the burning book as students gathered discussing the event. A week ago today in the early morning, I personally found a partially burned holy, a copy of the Holy Quran in between the walkway of the C and R building. These events continue to reoccur. These events are a cause for concern for the Arab and Muslim communities on campus, but not limiting to even the extent to other minority groups. This act of intolerance cannot be ignored and shunned away. It must be fought and understood in order to prevent further intolerance among religious, cultural, or sexual differences that seem to separate us. I come to you as an Arab American, born in Beirut, Lebanon, and a product of Pasadena City College. I am transferring to uh, the University of California at Berkeley. Pasadena has cultivated me into an academic and well-rounded individual, and I am truly thankful and will certainly miss the three years I've had here at PCC. But to get back to my point, there is a lot of diversity among PCC students, and there are various events throughout the year that relate and acknowledge the adversities being faced within those various 
um, minority communities, whether it's Latino, black, or Asian. However, personally, I am deeply saddened that throughout my years here at PCC, not one event has taken place in regards to understanding the Arab American or Muslim community that could have provided for a contemporary educational case to combat this type of discrimination and intolerance. I understand that there is not as much Arab or Muslim students as the aforementioned minority groups, but I still, but, but it should still be discussed and examined. There is injustice within all communities, and I believe 9-11 truly changed our lives. Um, today, there are many words of hate and misconceptions within our TV stations, radio stations, and politics um, that, uh, within our day-to-day -day life. There is, this is a current issue facing our country and nation, and this brand of discrimination is relevant to today. Therefore, I believe that this institution of ed education has a duty in educating its students on these misconceptions by acknowledging the adversity is currently face, being faced by the Muslim or Arab American community and continuing to battle against all forms of intolerance or hate through understanding and love. Dr. Rocha, do we have um, any report on this that you could, could uh, share with yes, us? Yes, we take it very seriously. I, I uh, received a report today from uh, Dean Scott Thayer that this occurred. Uh, and uh, we have launched a criminal investigation uh, and are uh, leaving no stone unturned to see if we can find uh, the individual responsible for it. Um, and then I completely agree with your feelings and the sentiment that we do. Um, we'll need to uh, create some opportunities in the, in the very uh, uh, short-term future uh, to educate the community about these issues. Uh, I'm deeply disturbed by it, and uh, it's just simply um, not uh, uh, acceptable. Um, Scott, is, that, is there any other information that you have on this? Can you come up to the microphone, please, Scott? Yes, uh, Carrie Afuso in my office. Um, she was the cross-cultural center coordinator. Is working with our some of our student leaders to put together uh, a teaching, um, maybe an interfaith breakfast event, to to publicize and, and and get the dialogue started so that that we won't have this type of intolerance on campus. Um, once we receive the report, we tried to get a group together as quickly as possible, and so we're working on that right now. Are there questions of Mr. Thayer or Dr. Rocha, Mr. Baum? I just want to thank Ahmed. I know you've been a student leader for a couple of years, and thank you for bringing this to our attention because this is a, a very disturbing report, and this is not what the uh, what the, the Pasadena City College community represents or stands for. And I know you know that it's very bo uh, bothersome to, to hear about this. It's not only an act of vandalism, but then it also crosses the line into a hate crime, and we'd, we'd react the same way if somebody found a burning cross on on a, on in the quad or something like that. And so I hope by, by saying something and, and hearing from our president and hearing from our administration that this is, this is uh, the, the administration and this institution embrace our Arab American students, our students of faith from the Muslim community, and that, uh, and, and that does not represent, nor will it be tolerated. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else? Um, I just wanted to, because I am leaving, to kind of just set the precedence that um, further continued events in the future, maybe next year, can take place. And uh, this wouldn't just be ignored or just be uh, a certain issue, you know, addressed this year. Um, well, but I think uh, you guys uh, are going to be fine and more than capable in doing that. So I thank you very much for uh, listening to me today, and um, thank you. Well, thank you for bringing it to our attention. And as Dr. Rocha has said, it's not being uh, forgotten or overlooked or ignored. And so we will uh, uh, have a report back to you at our next meeting as to what we've discovered. But uh, uh, certainly we do not uh, want anyone burning the Koran any place, period, certainly not on our own campus. Uh, so. uh, the next uh, request we have is from uh, Vlad Visky. Hello. So I looked over the board packet, and at pages 92 and 101, consent item number 117B and consent item uh, one, uh, 118B, 
In the first one, you see uh, expenses for advertising for the new vice president, uh, $15,000, $2,000, $1,000. The second document, the 118B, is even more outrageous because it's $35,000 to provide meeting rooms and food services for search committees for confidential interviews of candidates for executive positions at the West End Pasadena. So $35,000 for the West End Hotel in Pasadena being spent for the o o Operation VPs. So how is this possible? That's someone's salary for a whole year. This is a waste of taxpayers' money, and the community should know about it. And um, this could actually save seven sections for students at PCC. Uh, and what is uh, the Western offering that's so special and the Pasadena City College campus cannot offer? And in this economic times, is it smart, the smart thing to do to spend $35,000 uh, uh, paying a hotel uh, for renting, uh, uh, provide meeting rooms. And it is, it is outrageous and I think uh, the board should look over it and uh, not throw money out the window. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rocha, do you want to comment on this? Uh, uh, no. no, thank you. Okay. Uh, it'll be a uh, consent item and we'll take it up as a board at that, uh, at that time. Um, I believe that's all we have on non-agenda items. I have a request from David Krause to, I actually have a request from a couple of others to address uh, Simon Fraser and um, item E and item H and David Krause to address item R. So we'll get to those. He, he says non-agenda. Oh, okay. Uh, Simon Fraser then, uh, non-agenda. Good evening. It is really unfortunate that we have to talk about time, place, and manner at this time when, as Ahmad Kasfi pointed out, there's been essentially what is a hate crime on campus. Uh, originally, I was going to come to you guys today to talk about time, place, and manner and the way that currently it's sort of being pursued at PCC. And I think there may be some talk that time, place, and manner is not ne necessary, isn't required. I have a sort of a moderated view on this, and I wanted to let the Board of Trustees know what my view on time, place, and manner is. The policy document, which was as currently presented, it had a few flaws in it, um, but essentially the policy itself was generally sound in that it tried to prohibit speech that should not generally and is already protect, um, prohibited under you know, First Amendment laws and so on and so forth. Um, and a lot of the concern that you will hear about the time, place, and manner policy, at least in its current incarnation, of course it may change in the future, is going to be about the, the procedures itself and how the procedures implement the time, place, and manner policy. Given the last few years, and I, I've really thought very difficultly about this, because free speech is a big... I appreciate the value of free speech. I'm always talking about whether it's Brown Act or whether it's anything else. Free speech is kind of important to this campus. But making sure that speech doesn't go too far, like as you saw with the um, burning of the Holy Quran book, there is a limit. And I think that there are constitutionally defined limits as well that allow for where free speech should be prohibited. The current incarnation of the time, place, and manner policy, I do believe, goes too far. And at an academic senate meeting, I expressed the same view, and so did I believe the academic senate, although I'm sure they'll, they will speak for themselves on the issue if and when it comes up. I, I would like the Board of Trustees to just be aware that a time, place, and manner policy of some form will most likely be required because it will give you a framework that will allow what can be done and what cannot be done. I would suggest that when this Board look at such a policy, it consider, and it will do probably pretty soon, hopefully, that the Board look at, rather than limiting speech and restricting it, that the board consider actually taking a position that protects free speech that we should allow rather than limiting to what we shouldn't allow. There is a distinction um, which um, definitely in Britain some legal scholars would say as positive rights or negative freedoms. 
and I believe that the time, place, and manner policy should generally work on a policy of positive rights um, with a combination of negative freedom so that you don't restrict too much, but that you allow the general, what would be considered reasonable free speech to occur without promoting hate speech. It is a very fine line, and I would like to draw the board's attention to an issue that's going to be coming up before you, hopefully very soon, but that when you do so, you consider these two very opposing concepts almost, that you have to consider whether or not speech is just protected at all costs and what shouldn't be allowed. And while the current time, place, and manner policy, I do believe, has some flaws that should be addressed, and I believe this is generally a consensus view of the campus, I would say that unlike a couple of people that I've heard, not necessarily tonight, but other places, a time, place, and manner policy is necessary, but one that is more protective of free speech rather than limiting what speech can occur where. So I would just hope that the Board of Trustees consider this when the issue come back. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Dow, do you want to take about two minutes to explain time, place, and manner and freedom of speech? With all due respect, Mr. Thompson, I think since that's not before the board tonight, uh, there's probably a better forum for me to have that kind okay. of conversation, provide assistance to the college on that. And uh, as I was listening to Mr. Frazier's remarks, I, I want to uh, request the opportunity to work with Dr. Rocha to set up a meeting of some kind where I can have conversations with some of the campus constituency members to talk about uh, not only what I understand the law to be, but what their issues actually are. Yeah. Okay. And that, uh, that's what I'd like to suggest that the board allow me to do. Dr. Mann? Uh, I would just like to, first of all, ask for clarification. The, the college has a time, place, and manner of speech right now, does it not? The recommendation was that we should revise it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the board does not approve procedures. The board only approves policy. So concerns that you have about procedures should be addressed administratively. I think what Ms. Dahl is saying that she wants to work with Dr. Rocha and develop the, uh, the uh, policy statement on time, place, and manner, and also Well, both to the policy and, and to, to respond to concerns about yes. the proposed procedures and uh, examine what those uh, requested changes or concerns might be. Um, and maybe we can solve some of the problems. Okay. Other comments on that? Good. Thank you. Um, I think those are anybody else to address the board on a non-agenda item? If not, we'll move back to the agenda. Item F is approval of consent items. Um, are there any that need to be uh, addressed uh, separately? No. If not, motion to approve. Second. Okay. Um, any questions, comments? No, Mr. Pack? Uh, uh, Advisory vote? Oh. <laughs> aye. <laughs> okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Appointment uh, G, appointment to Measure P, Citizens Oversight Committee, discussion with possible action. Mr. Baum, I think this yeah, is your... Yeah, I'd like um, to first move the, uh, the, uh, the uh, nomination of the appointment of Michael Davitt to the Measure P Committee. Is there a second? Second. second. And, and just a 15-second background. Uh, uh, my district's appointee, Laura Olasso, served with distinction, <laughs> and she also serves on the City Council of the City of La Cunada, Flint Ridge, has asked uh, to uh, inform me that she wishes to step down from the committee. And in her place, I'm pleased to nominate the new city council member from the city of La Cunada, Flint Ridge, Michael Davitt. Mike is the head of, uh, of real estate for the Archdiocese for the city of Los An uh, for the, uh, the Ca uh, Catholic Church of Los Angeles area. And uh, he also is an active supporter of community colleges. He serves on the board of the Glendale Community College Foundation, and he also serves on the uh, a bond oversight committee for Glendale College because his last name may be familiar to, to many folks. Is He's the son of John Davitt, the longtime president of Glendale College. And Mike's a great guy, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted he's willing to serve if the board will approve his nomination. Okay. Uh, moved. I believe there was a, was there a second to the motion? I'll second the motion. Ms. Brown seconded. Um, any discussion? Advisory vote? Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, motion carries. Um, Thompson. 
President Thompson, yes. may, I, may I ask uh, Trustee Blum, would you have us uh, invite Mr. Davitt to the next meeting? I would like to do that, as, and uh, I expect that, uh, I, as, as I mentioned too, now that we've approved that, I hope an announcement goes out into the local uh, okay. uh, papers of, the, of his appointment, especially the La Cunada Flint Ridge Outlook and the uh, Valley Sun. So I'll, I'll ask Vice President Van Pelt to get the contact info and, and uh, do all the uh, details. So. And also, I, I hope a letter of appreciation uh, goes from the college to yes. Laura Lasso for her service. The next item is H, the Student Activity Fee Report, discussion with possible action. We have a request from Mr. Fraser to address us on this. Is there going to be any type of presentation first to set the background? Um, yes. Okay, let's do uh, that I would and then invite... Uh, Dean Thayer back to the podium, and uh, Dean Thayer is going to uh, offer a report. You'll see it on your screen, and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, Scott. All right, thank you. Um, board President Thompson, Dr. Rocha, members of the board, uh, the campus community, good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Thayer. I'm the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs. In your board packet, you should have already received a report on the student activity fee. I'm just gonna go over some items to, and after that I'll take questions regarding um, any questions you may have about the activity fee. Um, student service fund is the policy which the student activity fee falls underneath. Um, it's board policy um, 46, 43, uh, excuse me. It's um, a little history of, of of the policy. It was first chartered in May of 72. And last year, during the joint meeting with the Associated Students, it was amended. And that was at the May 6th meeting. Uh, it was about a year ago today, a few weeks ago. And at that meeting, a, a request was made to come back to give an overview, an update of the counting of the student um, activity fee. So it is procedure number 4630. Uh, the purpose of the activity fee is to fund programs and activities that benefit the students of Pasadena City College. Um, it is administered by the Student Service Fund Board of Directors, uh, which is represented by all constituent groups on campus. Um, I just listed the, the different folks that, that are involved in this. Um, it's also in your, your packet as well. Um, so it's a nine member board that has four students myself, administrative representative, students, faculty, and staff. <coughs> um, the disposition of funds to be expended upon the approval of the majority of the board. So the board of directors, a student service fund, uh, we meet and based upon our uh, majority vote, that's how the pro programs, activities, events are funded. Um, the different different uh, things that can be funded through the student activity fee, educational services, campus services, co-curricular services and programs, student activities, college recognition and awards, student program operational expenses, and this is all listed in the actual policy. Um, an overview of the activity fee for this past year, um, being that this was our first year of implementation, um, we were conservative in our allocation of funds, but you can see the breakdown of what we've collected um, and what we have allocated. So we collected 575,000 approximately and allocated about 453,000. Um, and we had about 60 refund requests from students. The, the students, um, the student service fund had allocated funds to the clubs uh, with the activity fee and the Associated Students of Pasadena City College require that any club that receives funds must do service hours. So there's a minimum requirement of five hours of service that the students are required to do if their club or organization receives funding and a maximum of 125 hours. And it's, it's a scale based upon how much money is allocated. Um, and I believe anything over $2,000 is 125 service hour requirement. So the funding equates to service hours. So basically our students that receive funding then have to go out and do volunteer work on and off campus. So that there is a benefit to this as well that our students are, are getting involved and, and doing service. Um, and to date we have about 2,200 service hours 
that, that have taken place or will take place this year um, for our student clubs. So that is just a brief, quick overview of the student activity fee. Um, the accounting of the activity fee and the breakdown is in your report. It's itemized through student business services. Um, each account has been set up and monitored using the district standard operating procedures and we get monthly reports on the um, accounts. So with that, that is uh, my brief overview, and I'll, if you have any questions. Before we get the board into questions, let's, uh, Simon Frazier asked to address the board on this item, so let's ask him if he wouldn't mind coming forward and uh, raising his uh, points, and then we'll have a, uh, his perspective in mind or his questions in mind as we get into the discussion. You may often hear me complaining or criticizing or suggesting a course of action. Um, in this case, it's one of the fortunate times where I get to say that this is a fantastic thing that PCC has done, and I am beyond impressed with the way that it's actually been Did run Did Mr. So Thayer far. take you outside and have a conversation before? <laughs> Believe it or not, we, um, Dr. Thayer and I have had many discussions on a lot of topics, and this is one where we both agree. The student activity fee has done a heck of a lot of good for this college. Unfortunately, you were all treated to me on the screen during a video where I looked terrible, unfortunately, talking about how wonderful the student activity fee was. Um, so I'm going to reiterate it in person. The student activity fee has allowed the clubs, the AS, and various bodies directly related to students to be able to really improve the service and the experience that students have on this campus. It, it is one thing, I first came to this college in winter of 2010, and I was generally, like everyone else, I thought you just came to the class and you left. And then I started to get involved slowly, and I realized just how much of an experience to rival a four-year institution. I'd come from a three-year institution in Britain, uh, akin to a four-year institution, and I really didn't believe that a community college could offer the same kind of experience, and now I've learned that it absolutely can. And it is really, especially this year, thanks to the student activity fee. As the officer of the um, QA the Queer Alliance Club, which is an LGBT club on campus, we were able to put on a fantastic slew of events and more events yet to come thanks to the student activity fee. There are probably about 60 odd clubs that could say the exact same thing, ranging from everything from religion to social justice to sustainability, and it's all really thanks to the student activity fee. When you guys approved this fee for a pilot program, you opened up a fantastic opportunity for the students on this campus to really get involved. And I would see it as such a shame if the student activity fee went away because of the amount of good that we have been able to do with it. And I have to commend the AS and the OSA for doing a fantastic job of both allocating it, using it, and making sure that the student activity fee is stretched as far as it can be. Because even with frugality of assigning the fee, we have been able to put on some fantastic events for students. And, and community college has to be more than you take your class and you leave. It has to provide opportunities for students to learn, to grow, to actually find the person within themselves that is so important to whatever they're going to do in their major. And it's helped me find that. And it's helped probably thousands of students as well like it. So I would urge the board, if it takes action tonight, to continue the student activity fee because of the amazing and positive impact that it has had on Pasadena City College. That is the extent of my comment. Thank you very much. Very good. Very good. Mr. Baum? I have a few questions, but I want to get uh, to the crux of what's on the table, too. As I recall, are, is, is this being brought back to us? Because I believe, I think, I, I, I know I supported it last year and was the intention that would be brought back to us after a year and that we have to take action to then renew it for next year. Is that the understanding? Because I, I'm looking at the policy and it doesn't look like that we would have to actually take action to not renew it. And so I'm not sure. Uh, what is the understanding of the administration? I would uh, go back to uh, uh, Dean Thayer since I, you know, to be frank with you, Trustee Baum, I, I was not here um, to receive that uh, recommendation last year. So what is your recollection? recollection? Well, my understanding is 
um, it is an approved policy that with, with the, in the motion, it was reviewing the minutes from last year that you requested that there be an accounting of the activity fee fund be presented within a year. So we and would so, have to actually take action for it not to be imposed that's my on students next yes. year. Because I, I, the policy I, I, I just pulled up on my iPad, I have the policy, just states a very general policy. It's actually in the procedures mm -hmm. that the, uh, the, the activity fee is imposed. So uh, the policy just says that there, sh there should be a student services fund. So as I understand, we would actually act, have to take action not to, uh, to, to not renew it. But then, so th I just want to be clear on that. Number two, I have a couple questions for you, then I have a couple questions for the students. The student activity fee is one part of the student service fund. Yes. And the, the activity fee, as I read it, collected $575,000. This were funds that were not available before. So we, we taxed our students $575,000 mm -hmm. to, to create this fee, uh, to create this fund. Is that correct? Well, actually, the students voted, if you recall right, last yeah. year, two-thirds yes. voted to approve the fee. Yes. And so they, they contributed to the fee. But this comes from the students. This is, this is an activity fee, so this is new for this year. Yes. The other sources of student services fund, as I understand it, are, are revenues from the bookstore, food service, and other play, uh, places on campus. Uh, yes, is, that's correct. What that's was the amount of that revenue? Uh, the total of that um, was about $360,000. So three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So that's on top of the five hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. Yes. And the student services fund funds a number of things. The uh, uh, that uh, that are are not just club support, but who? What other types of uh, organizations, activities uh, get supported through the student services fund? Well, basically, what we did as as a group. Um, and the band would be one. I just right. our, our marching band is, is a huge one. Uh, athletics programming. Mm -hmm. um, let me have a list here as well. But what we tried to do, uh, art gallery, uh, CEC high school graduation, um, commencement, dance department, courier forensics, health science graduation. So those are things separate. From These are the, separate. Photo but ID operations. But also, there's some discretionary funds that go to various departments, uh, right? That. Uh, <coughs> To, to support certain activities in various departments. Yeah, basically the process what we have is in the fall of each year, we'll put out a, a, re, a request, if anyone's interested in, in um, requesting funds from mm -hmm. the Student Service Fund, we'll put it out to the campus community, right. and then they apply. Sure. And so what's happened is, I mean, even these programs like the band um, mm -hmm. that's been going on and marching in our Rose Parade for years, they applied for additional funds to support their activities. So they come and do a presentation, so have the opportunity to request an amount based upon what they feel they need mm -hmm. for the year. Sure. The group will, will discuss it and allocate it. Um, our discussion had been really to, to focus the activity fee money for on-campus uh, events that directly impact students, whereas our student service fund had, had been a, allowed us to really enhance the co-curricular programming um, and, and, and within the instructional divisions uh, so they can do creative things um, as well as the clubs and sure. the campus event. So what we try to do is separate the two, use the activity fee mo money more for the clubs and things that happen on campus, whereas the student service fund really was more of the traditional things that have been funded through that um, so, amount. So let, let me ask you this, and then before we go into actual the, um, the allocations for the student activity fee. So we collected 575 from students, and we have also 360, 360,000 from the other sources of revenue from the Student Services Fund. In one, one of the things I had advocated for is saying if, if, we, if the student activities fee generated sufficient revenue, we could actually no longer have to depend on bookstore or food services for additional funds to support because it, it's got 200,000 more than that. And therefore, we could actually reduce bookstore prices to our students uh, because it, we could replace that. What would be an argument to then say, Okay, let's set that money aside uh, and, and and lower the bookstore prices for our students instead of to, uh, and then and the, all the funds we need are more than enough covered by the student activity fee. Well, I, the bookstore falls under administrative services, so I know they have some things that that would fall into play with that. But in regards to textbooks, um, which is which is a big thing that the bookstore sells, the mm -hmm. margin on that is is minimal considering. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there, there's not a large profit margin on that. So to, to reduce textbook prices, which is a big issue for students, mm -hmm. um, what they have to pay for textbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, the students right now have the option, um, they go mm -hmm. online and, and they shop. Mm -hmm. And so basically our bookstore has to maintain, um, they have to be in the black every year. Uh, and they've done a lot of things to enhance the experience for students on campus. Also, money that is generated through the bookstore, food service, uh, vending is recycled back. So it's, we'll allocate funds to groups. They'll spend the money on campus in our bookstore, in our cafeteria. So it, it's a cycle of money being recycled. Whereas if they take that money off campus, then there is no, um, no opportunity for those dollars to be circulated on right, campus. That's what I'm saying. They're, they're gonna, they're gonna, things will cost less for them at the bookstore, so more of that money will stay on campus. But that's, uh, uh, that's, Procedure. Uh, that's, yeah, that's what I, I think Mr. Pack may want to comment on, on that. You want to mind. comment on that specifically? Because I have a lot on, of questions for on you. On the bookstore, yes. Um, I think I'm not necessarily opposed to lowering the prices in the bookstore. Um, I do think, though, that uh, high prices in bookstores are something that we see across the higher education system. And I think it's, it would take a much more concerted effort among very many colleges to lower the price of books because really we are at the mercy of the distributors. Well, I'm not of the talking books. about, but I just know right off the top we're, we're charging students extra couple hundred thousand dollars of revenue from the bookstore that that we might be able to put back in their pockets by lowering prices. Sure, and so, but I'm, what I'm suggesting is that to make any really meaningful impact on the cost of books, really, it would take a much larger effort than just lowering the prices of the PCC bookstore because. I mean, in my understanding of the, the bookstore also is that much of the revenue comes from the sale of non-book things. So, I mean, really the bookstore, I think the prices that we're charging for books right. are not outrageous compared to what you experience at other colleges. I'm saying if I could still put 300000 back in the pockets of students or customers of the bookstore. Um, well, let's go... Do you want uh, the administration to, to look into that and investigate well, that? Well, no, no, I, 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 uh, I, I think philosophically if we're going to raise funds for student activities through a fee, we should then subsequently, in turn, lower prices at the bookstore or, 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 because the fee is actually a clear fund that you can identify instead of, I don't know if I'm paying an extra $5 a book or an extra dollar a book or an extra $5 a cap or, or uh, $2 But what I'm asking is, do you want the administration to uh, look into that suggestion and then come back to us with some report or some I, recommendation? I, I don't want to direct the administration um, for anything yet until we have a, a board kind of uh, agreement uh, on it. So I want to get to the, the crux of that, but that's, a, that's an issue for me uh, as well. Okay. And, but, and then I want to go through this, how the, the fees were out, the funds were allocated, but I, I see Ms. Waugh has her. I just wanted to echo um, Trustee Baum's concern because I, I had heard a lot of discussion also about the cost of textbooks. And I don't want to direct um, the administration to do anything in particular other than um, when we look at the cost of textbooks to the students. And, um, you know, maybe one of the things that we could look for is the offering of, of text through e-books or um, some partnership with a resale, you know, just something to help the students. So I do agree that if they're paying the extra fee and we have enough money, I'd certainly like to see the students be able to benefit in some way. So that's so. Then I want to I want to go to the issue, and I and I presume the the fee is uh, the, the activity fee expenditure. The allocations are made primarily with the direction of the student government and the, the rest of the committee. Correct. Yeah, the, yeah. the student service fund, the nine so, member group, and then the we've right. allocated funds to the clubs, and, and then, then the clubs well, have a process. Two other questions for you. you indicated that you. Um, the, the allocations are made, I'd, I'd be interested how you track how those funds are actually used and then how you're actually checking. To, you said that there's 2,200 2, service hours that have been generated. For what types of service does, does that do for, uh, how is that uh, counted? Well, basically the, and I know Nolan's intimate about this because he's a part of the service hours committee or has been in the past, but generically um, the clubs will allocate through their funding committee X amount of dollars to a club, say it's $2,000. So that club's now required to co uh, complete 125 service hours. Um, that committee has a service uh, committee as well. They have a funding committee and a service committee. So each club has to submit to the service hours committee their completed hours prior to being eligible to receive <coughs> additional funding. So what they do is they'll track that. And, and what is it uh, about? 
on-campus events. Um, anytime students participate on campus with volunteering, uh, for example, the job fair, those students were, were receiving service hour credit. Um, welcome day is another event. Th those are on-campus events. Then we have um, some students going to the community and volunteer, and they'll get a letter. They'll bring that back and say, I did 20 hours of volunteer service for my club. Those hours are tallied, and then those clubs are informed if they've met their requirements. So I'm, if I'm manning a booth for my club at Welcome Day, is that also volunteer service hours? No, no. The volunteer hours don't count for representing your own club. Actually, I don't think clubs get any hours during Welcome Week um, and Club, or sorry, Club Week, um, because Club Week is when clubs advertise for themselves. So they do not get volunteer hours for staffing their own event. Um, it's for events that Associated Students or the Office of Student Affairs or different parts of the college host. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I just also want to stress that students do often go off campus to get, collect their service hours in various organizations in the community. So it really is getting students to branch out and experience uh, many different components of our community. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, how are you um, auditing how the people are using the funds? Well, we basically, they'll submit their proposal at the beginning they'll be allocated funds and then if they want to use those funds we have a process where they the advisor the club president has to sign a requisition attach an invoice that goes to my office we verify that that they have the money and then i'll sign it and then we'll move it to the vice president administrative services offices so that we know that we have the balance are intact the invoices are attached so we know exactly where the, the funds are being do utilized. those come through us at some point too no no i i, I don't recall that so and let I'll take one more minute and, and then just like what I'm concerned about some of these expenditures or allocations that I've seen so what uh, and, but some of them I just don't know what's what's mm -hmm. and I'll ask the students what's the BAMN club BAM the BAM club yeah um, I don't know what the acronym stands for I badminton. the acronym stands for by any means necessary what is that they are a part of the um, Defend Affirmative Action Party. They, we have a, a chapter here on this campus that's manned by uh, one, a student and a number of, of students here. And their main purpose is to foster social justice and to defend affirmative action and also to work towards the passing of the DREAM Act in California and also in the United States. Okay. And then what is Campus Crusade for C-T-H-U-L-U? That one actually is um, it's a gaming club. Uh, it, it arose out of sort of, uh, there are lots of campus crusades for blank, uh, you know, insert whatever here. And so Cthulhu is sort of just um, a lighthearted way of, of naming the, the club that does sort of board games, card games, online gaming, and video games. Okay. What is CHDV? Uh, child development. Child development. Okay. Perhaps we can shortcut this. Maybe you can well, make a list of uh, well, things you'd like okay. answers to. Well, I would like to know what is uh, this says. This makes it sound like we're funding a, an entire position. It says cross-cultural position. Is this a full-time, ongoing staff position funded by the Student Activities Fund? And was that an intention of the fund? Well, that was a, a discussion that came up this year. Uh, we have a part-time cross-cultural center coordinator. We have had that position funded out of the flea market for almost 20 years. Uh, we heard tonight uh, some incidents that have occurred on campus. The Cross-Cultural Center has been a hub for where our cultural programming has occurred. Uh, the funding has been inconsistent. Um, it's been up and down. We've been able to do a lot with the minimum things that we do. So the proposal was the Cross-Cultural position also is the volunteer center position, which means with all so these I'm, new but service But answer hours, my question, is this to fund a staff position? This would be to fund the, the position. Does the, does the procedure and the policy allow for the student activity fee to fund positions? I, I'm just not sure. I asked that question to myself um, when I first heard about this, and I, I, the policy, as far as I understand it, says that it can cover operational expenses and various other things for programs. And so if we consider the Cross-Cultural Center program in which students are direct participants, which is the language of the policy, then I think technically it would be allowed within the language that we've set forth. So this is another way to, to do a hiring. Is this position hired by the district and then by the board? Uh, because we actually approve all hiring. It just to, basically, our flea market coordinator position, similar, is funded by the flea market. It's not. It's auxiliary dollars. But mm -hmm. the process is the same process any employee would go through through the issue contract. So basically, <coughs> what we stipulate is the position is in place uh, if the funding is in place. 
and, and the person in the position understands that. So, for example, if this position was in place, and, and we stated this in the initial recommendation, was mm -hmm. it'd be reviewed annually to see if, if this is something that would continue. So what you're saying is it's kind of like what Dr. Sugimoto were able to, to supplement the funding for her position through contributions from the foundation, so we're able to supplement funding for this position through the student activity fund. Yes, because currently it's flea market funded, so it's non-district funded at this time. What's the Interclub Council spring funding for $30,000? That's a, a, an additional amount allocated to the clubs to receive funding for the spring. Okay. Then, then lastly, I guess uh, I'll go back to Ahmed's point, um, and this will seem hard-hearted, but if we could find $5,700 to, to fund a, a student gender bender day, how do we use that? Um, why didn't we fund anything that increased uh, cultural awareness or appreciation for the Arab American or the Muslim community? Well, we have, um, we look at all proposals that are submitted. And during that process, people are given the opportunity to do presentations. Um, if, if we don't receive a proposal, we don't fund per se a specific event. Now, the Cross-Cultural Center historically has been able to do a lot of those things, but because of the limited staff time, mm -hmm. um, well, it sounds like the, the ones who are the closest to the process get the first pick of the money, and the folks who maybe haven't been invited to be part of the process get left out in the cold. Well, we have 70 clubs on campus, and they're all informed about the funding process in their meetings. And so each of our clubs are chartered and in good standing. So we, we, we try to make a conscious effort to get the word out to make sure everyone is, it has an opportunity. Mr. Pack first, and then Ahmad has... Yeah, I think a, a couple of things that I just want to say on that. I think that... The clubs and organizations closest to the money getting the most, I think, is definitely um, something I want to address because I think it, it's that's it's not an accurate perception at all. As someone who's participated um, in all all levels of the student activity fee funding, from the data the says otherwise, Nolan. The data, the, the allocations say otherwise. Right, right, right. Who gets but, the most money are the are are the people that are closest to you and Jamie and who other, others? As I look at this, so well, I I think one of the issues though is that. We, we can't fund an event that wasn't proposed. Like the Student Service Fund Committee and the ICC uh, Funding Committee, we don't make events happen. We just approve proposals that are coming to us. So if, if there's not a proposal for something, there's no way for us to give it money. I'll, I'll let uh, Ahmad the process. Have, uh, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, technically appreciate if uh, my call would be used in the political matters on, and the differences w within this conversation. Um, I guess Nolan was kind of alluding to that there is no, you know, Arab or Muslim club here on campus, even though we have, you know, a, a significant amount of them. Um, for various reasons, I have no idea. Maybe fear or, some, or something else. Who knows? There could be a hundred different reasons why exactly. But um, so those events can't, shouldn't, or probably wouldn't come through. I think the cultural diversity, I guess, position um, does entail a lot of work and um, would probably need to be adequately funded if those... Um, if we do expect an even broader um, form of uh, events or cultural activities to take place. So it's not really like, um, why is it that um, the gay alliance or the queer alliance on campus is being funded events and not um, uh, Middle Eastern events? I think that both of them definitely need to be funded. And I think um, this student activity fee could just broaden and provide more money and more funds for even more events to take place. And that could be all inclusive on that end, and not actually restricting. And, uh, I, and nobody's the, advocating like, restriction. No, I, I think I think we're we're raising issues here, and we're certainly not going to be in a position to answer all of the questions this evening. But I think uh, uh, legitimate issues. I think Ms. Brown wanted to say something, or oh, Dr. Mann, and then Dr. Rocha. Yes, I uh, I was opposed to to the student activity fee. Those of you who were here remember because. I thought that this was not a good time to put additional uh, demand on students, but I see only 60 students ask for a waiver, and I don't know whether that means they didn't know how to or not. But I was very impressed by the testimony of the student of the improvement of the quality of student life. So I think that is a legitimate use, but I would like to point out that the money that was collected for the student activity fee would have funded 96 sections of courses if it had been gone to that purpose. And I guess my point in pointing that out is there's a lot, the campus is very complex and there's a lot of different needs for funds. And I don't know if the students were aware of that, if they would think it's more important to fund the clubs as opposed to funding 96 classes. Okay. 
Dr. Rocha? Yeah, well, maybe I can be uh, helpful in wrapping this up for tonight since it's my <laughs> item. Um, you know, uh, first of all, I'd say I, I take uh, very seriously and deeply respect uh, Trustee Baum's uh, helpful questions, which I take as helping the report to be better. Um, and uh, so towards that end, a couple of comments, and then um, I want the board to know that I'm not bringing anything. If this is a discussion. I'm not bringing anything for action uh, to the board tonight, but I will um, give a signal here of um, where, you know, based on this discussion, uh, where I think we, we ought to go. <clears throat> First of all, I would say that out of the uh, questions, and all questions are fair, that as we develop this report, um, you will notice in uh, Vice President Van Pelt's report um, that now he puts a line or two of explication uh, under uh, items that uh, is explanatory items. And I think it would be helpful um, since many of us are not familiar with, uh, you know, to have a thumbnail um, a description of each one of these items, and I'm sure you have it, and that would make the report longer, but I think that it would uh, be helpful with, with some of the questions. Um, the other thing, and you know, and again, I'm speaking entirely for myself, I brought this forward because it's a required report. Uh, you know, we need to discuss this out in the open, right? Uh, and then uh, the uh, administration will bring back to the board a, uh, a recommendation, and of course, um, you know, work with associated uh, students on this. I would note, and, and here's uh, one of the questions. I am um, supportive of the, of the uh, student fee, and uh, I want to uh, work my way towards making a recommendation towards that end um, at a uh, subsequent meeting. I would note, and the primary reason for that uh, Simon, if you will, we're, we're going to uh, move on here. We've had public comment, and so um, it, it's kind of distracting to be talking and you have your hand up. So, I can wait until I, until you're well, well, that'll I think be what, up to. What we're saying is that we, we had a good public discussion. We're not taking action this evening, so when Dr. Rocha is finished, I think we're going to move on to the next agenda item. So, yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Um, if you look, for example, at the fall of 2010, uh, $274,700, and the mm -hmm. fee is $10, mm -hmm. okay? So if I'm doing my math correctly, okay, and so you math people out there, check me on this. Uh, <laughs> that means that 27,470 students, or registrations, if you will, uh, opted uh, to pay the fee or if you will, opted not to request the refund. Right. My experience is that's a very high rate of subscription and that you could, not conclusively, but you could take that as a very high rate of support among the students for the student fee. The thing that I would uh, ask uh, Scott and associated students and the, re and the reason, and I will probably work with you so that we can um, uh, develop a recommendation to continue this uh, for at least another year um, is that I think that I take Trustee uh, Baum's questions, at least for me, and this is only my own, uh, I don't want to speak for uh, Trustee Baum, is that we want to make sure that, um, that this uh, high rate of subscription does uh, uh, represent uh, the, the will of the students, if you will. Okay. And it seems to, on, on the numbers, one thing we might do is to make sure that it's clear to students that they have an opt-out. Okay. Because I take, again, uh, the trustees' comments as being not oppositional to the fee, but to the process that allocates what is a significant amount of money by anyone's measure. Um, the um, you know, I'm looking at it, this, the Academic Senate does not get this much money right. uh, for um, its activities. And I think, uh, if I can speak my own concern, but I'm sure that we can reconcile this with uh, Trustee Baum's uh, very fair concerns, is that um, the, we want to make sure that 
all 27,470 students who paid the fee have an opportunity to know how they access the benefits of the fees. Because whether it's um, a uh, more broad religious and educational program, uh, it is not yet clear after one year um, what the breadth of the service is. But, but that's also why I would say my, my own view that we should probably continue because that needs to be uh, clarified. Some of the other questions, again, I think uh, ought, to, uh, uh, ought to be uh, uh, gotten answers to and move on. I would say finally, though, that when we have this, and uh, a fee is a fee is a fee, okay? whether it's a student fee for tuition or a fee is a fee is a fee. And I think all of us need to be concerned that where students are charged a fee, that it is a, um, you know, uh, something that benefits uh, uh, the, the greatest number for the greatest good. But I think that we can uh, work this out. So therefore, I, uh, forgive me, trustees, for um, uh, having this longer than I would have wished uh, for, but the re re report is required, and so I'd ask uh, for um, uh, time to uh, work with the dean and work with associated students to develop a, a recommendation for next year on which you can vote. How much time will you think you need to do that? Um, as if, I think we have the June f 1st meeting, but it'll, let's do it in at, the, at the second June meeting. Okay. okay. Just a reminder, we are leading up to commencement. Yeah. And I only say that just because okay. it's yeah. a really well, busy time, but we can. We'll have to burn we'll, some we'll midnight oil. Okay. 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 We'll uh, aim then for the uh, June 16th or 15th, I guess, uh, 15th. Yeah. Uh, and that'll same. give me time to fully consult the trustees and make sure that I have their uh, um, feedback and can feed back that back and get a bill that will uh, move forward. Because I, I do think we need to move forward with it. One point I noticed is, is that, um, you know, the largest expenditure is, for, is almost $100,000 for the I-PASS, which we were just awarded for. And I think under any circumstances, um, you know, I, I think that's a, a good thing. Well, Mr. Martin and then Dr. Fellow. Well, I want to ask you a question. So we've been beating this on this topic for a long time, but there hasn't really been any chance for the rest of the trustees to comment at all. If you as president are saying this is coming back for discussion and you want to hear my comments whenever it comes back for the first time, that's fine with me and I'll hold. No, I think I, I, Or I'm happy to make them now so you're hearing them now. Well, I think the, the but better... But you as the president and the superintendent want. Well, the, the better approach would be for you to bring them out now and then we can they can be considered as uh, the Dr. Roach and administration uh, deliberate on this, uh, I well, just then I'll, uh, I'll make mine succinctly if please. you let me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, number one, I oppose the fee, and I'm still against the fee. Uh, we have a lot of students with a lot of diverse needs here. Certainly, it's great that many students want to take advantage of social service and that social interaction, but it's a diverse thing. There's other campuses. There's people taking just one class. So I still uh, oppose a tax on our students. Uh, I want to commend the students for the way you have the service hours as a method for collecting the fees to the clubs. I think that's extremely complimentary. I think that was a great plan. I love it. So kudos there. Uh, it was my understanding when we were implementing this tax, one of the arguments in favor of it was that in addition to the social component, which many people find the social component very rewarding, and that's great, and that's important. I also thought there were longer library hours proposed, uh, additional tutoring labs, and other academic benefits to students besides just social club benefits to students, and I don't see and didn't hear one academic piece of benefit in everything that was reported here tonight. So maybe there is, and it just didn't come out, <coughs> But I thought that was part of the cell, and that would be something that would be important to me where students can see the benefit of this fee in an academic way if that's their goal, not just in a social <coughs> club way. So those are my comments. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. My, my 
comments follow on uh, what Trustee Martin just said is, can academic units apply for this? At the university, uh, we apply. For instance, the journalism program applies because uh, they bring students to Vietnam for two weeks as part of reporting public affairs. I apply for the Florence pro program. Is it open to academic units? Yes, um, and that's what the fall proposals are about. We, we come mm -hmm. together as a group, we solicit proposals, and then we review them. Um, this was the first year we went through this process. We've been going through the process with um, the student service fund, but with the activity fee, this is our first year. So we, you know, we're working out uh, the kinks in this process. But yes, academic uh, areas do apply and can apply. Okay. Other questions or comments this evening? Sorry, there's none on that end. Yeah. Ms. Brown? No, I'm okay. I was just checking what um, okay. Mr. Martin said. And just as we're directing the administration, I would welcome as part of the, the follow-up is a report on the student service, the entirety of the student services fund. Okay. Dr. Wilcox? Just to point out, in some of the consent items you approved tonight, a number of them were partially funded by the student service fund on some of those instructional trips, just as was described. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna have a report back then on June 15th, uh, meeting then. Yep. And. Um, I think you've gotten lots of questions and lots of um, uh, suggestions for uh, things to be looked at and report back to us. Uh, so let's then move on to the next item on the agenda, if we can, item I, which is the um, <coughs> annual re uh, board review of student trustee privileges, discussion with possible action. Mr. Clement has packed to lead this off, or? No, actually, um, it, it it, Nolan will. Um, this is an, is an item uh, for the trustees uh, for uh, discussion and possible action. Um, it is a, already a uh, bylaw that uh, provides for the uh, uh, student trustee. Okay, And uh, we reviewed this today with council. Uh, what is um, in front of you is the entire policy, but on the second page of the policy are the item five of the student trustee privileges. Right. These privileges each year are discretionary on the part of the board. Mm -hmm. uh, and these were the privileges that the trustees by vote uh, granted to current uh, trustee PAC. Uh, so it is time since uh, <coughs> Uh, I also learned today, because uh, I asked, that uh, Trustee Pack's um, term uh, officially ends on May 31st, okay? And uh, although, as a uh, ceremonially, he will, uh, of course, participate in uh, commencement. Uh, and then, of course, the, the students are uh, doing an election right now uh, for student trustee. So the uh, issue before the board um, that I'm putting in front of you is uh, the discussion of this policy and uh, the <coughs> approval of the current trustee, student trustee privileges uh, and or any uh, changes that the trustees wish to entertain. Can we perhaps start with Mr. Pack and let him Tell us I'd like to make a motion that we approve them. Second. Okay, but I, okay, okay, if you have a motion that, on that's the That's fine, table. but I don't, let's let Second. Nolan say, has it worked well, or are there things that ought to be in it, ought not to be in it, et cetera. So that's you want to ask him if taking the money out is going to help? <laughs> no, John, I'd just like to have <laughs> him comment on it, if that's okay. Uh, uh, well, I think, um, I mean, I've been really uh, honored to be able to participate with the Board of Trustees to the degree that I've uh, have in the last year and board retreats and so forth. I think that um, the policies that we have definitely allow for a very uh, lively uh, and engaging discussion, including the student trustee. So um, I've been completely satisfied with the policies as they exist. Uh, I know that one question that floats around is, should the student trustee have an actual vote or not? And I don't necessarily have a position on that myself. Um, but I think that the student trustee privileges as they're listed uh, in the current policy are uh, great. Okay. Dr. Mann? Yes, I would like to comment. I, and Mr. I'll let Mr. Martin make the, the motion. I, I think we've been fortunate here in having extraordinarily 
outstanding trustees. Each year, I think, Absolutely. well, we can't possibly get a better one, and then we, you know, we do. It is my understanding that this is all we legally can do for the student. We cannot actually give the student the right to have their vote counted to make the quorum. And, uh, well, you know, we first of all made the student, give the student the right to, to speak and then to make motions and second motions and then have their vote. You didn't used to have that. So I, I think that this has worked very well and if we legally could do more, I would be in favor of it. But I think if, if council's right here that this is the maximum that we can. Yeah, your policy goes as far as the law allows you to go. Yeah. So that's why we haven't gone farther. Mr. Bell? I just uh, also want to take this as an opportunity to recognize a, a former student trustee, Nick Zomet. He was the student trustee when I was the board president, and he's the one that first got us on this path to, uh, to where we are today. And, and as John said, we've, we've been fortunate by the distinct, uh, how distinguished our trustees have been and have added considerably to our deliberation, and we want to continue to empower the trustee and the student voice here on campus. Other comments? Mr. Martin, I think, made the motion. I don't believe it was seconded. No, second. Ms. Brown seconded. Moved and seconded that we uh, continue with the policy as is. Uh, student trustee advisory vote. Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Um, I'd also like to just briefly echo the comments, the complimentary comments about uh, Mr. Pack and the work he's done as student trustee. And uh, four years uh, nearly I've been on this board, we've had excellent student trustees and we're very fortunate and privileged to have that so thank you very much i'm going to do one thing and take one thing out of order because i see mr Krause has been sitting patiently there in the um, audience <laughs> and he's asked to speak on item r so uh if we might take that one uh, which That's is nice. to adopt a resolution number 474 for classified school employee week discussion of possible action mr cross so welcome thank you uh, president Thompson, uh, members of the Board of Trustees and guests, uh, my name is David Krause. I'm president of uh, Chapter 777 in facilities. Uh, I want to uh, thank the uh, administration and board for having this on the agenda. I think uh, any, any you know, recognition for classified employees is appreciated. Uh, I do have a short film, if you don't mind seeing it. It's only three minutes long, Good. and it's made by uh, Mount Sac. And unfortunately, uh, one mistake, there's 112 community colleges, not 110. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, when it was made, maybe it was actually. Is there audio? Uh, it, it will in a minute. Twenty-five thousand regular classified employees serving over 2.6 million students across 110 community colleges and the communities in which these colleges serve. This is a well-trained classified workforce that has embraced the concept of lifelong learning. Many classified employees have become community college students themselves in pursuit of an associate degree or higher. Many others already hold a bachelor's, master's, or doctorate degree. Other classified professionals are adjunct faculty or community education instructors. California's community college system is a machine that does not stop running. There are classified professionals on campus 24-7, including holidays, many of whom students or other campus members never see. Security officers, carpenters, food service workers, lighting technicians, research analysts, educational advisors, teaching assistants, groundskeepers, they are all here. Classified professionals are the bedrock of the institution. <coughs> when you think about it, classified employees are generally the first college employees that prospective students experience, the ones that support the students' efforts throughout their college stay, and the last ones students experience when they leave. What an honor classified professionals have in creating a campus environment that is conducive to learning and student success. We all share a common goal. One student's success is the result of hundreds of individuals working very diligently and quite honestly without ever crossing paths. Whether it is through student services, clean and safe campuses, teaching and learning, or providing technical support to name a few, in the end, 
It all comes back to the fact that when each student graduates, transfers, or has a successful college and educational experience, it is because it took a dedicated and dynamic village to raise that student. Could you imagine a day without a classified professional? Thank you very much. Is there a motion to um, approve the approval resolution? The resolution? Move approval of resolution second, second. 474. Okay, Dr. Mann has moved. I think Mr. Martin seconded. Uh, advisory vote? Aye. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Okay, now let's go back to our regular order on the agenda. Item J, under College Administration Reports and Recommendations, uh, Fiscal Services. Authorization to transmit third quarterly financial status report. Discussion with possible action. Move authorization to transmit. Second. Okay. Uh, we don't want to discuss it. No. Vice President Brian Pelt is on <laughs> for uh, items J and item K. Um, K first. Well, under tabs J and K are the two reports and um, obviously the, the numbers are tracking according to what we expected. And uh, rather than uh, go through the numbers, if there are any questions, I'd be pleased to answer them. We are, we're doing these two separately. Should we do them as a, as a package? Well, sorry, no, what separate. I meant was that under item uh, tab K is actually the second part of item J. Okay. I would, I would suggest that we, we uh, continue with any discussion and the action on J. Okay. Mm -hmm. Been a motion made and seconded. Uh, is there any are there any questions or discussion? No. Advisory vote. Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Item K. We do have one request from a member of the audience to address us on this. Dr. Van Pelt, do you want to do the overview? Um, so the governor uh, came out with his uh, May revise on Monday. And essentially, they found about $6 billion that they had not expected. Unfortunately, they cannot come up with a reasonable explanation for how that happened, which leaves people wondering um, whether there'd, there'd be a reversal on that. The governor's plan for that, however, is that he would like to, as he calls it, buy back some of the deferred apportionment that has been um, levied on the districts, in this case $350 million total, which would amount to about $7 million for PCC. Now what that means is that it would help us with our cash flow, but it has no impact on the budget because it's just money that they owe us. They would just catch up in the payment process. So it's not additional uh, <coughs> money for uh, general apportionment. Um, now in order to um, come up with the, the, uh, the next draft of the, the budget plan for um, the Budget and Resource Allocation Committee. I've passed out the, the uh, <coughs> colored uh, revision of the chart that's previously been distributed. And there are some significant changes, particularly on the first column retirement incentive, $3.14 million. <coughs> um, and I know that this is on the uh, agenda next. Uh, but this is a one-time savings, so it only applies to 2011-12. Thereafter, it does not change the base of, of, um, of the budget. Um, Non-filling of positions has been increased to 2.5 million. Optimized <coughs> sections remained at 1.5. And then I put in numbers for proposal purposes for revenue enhancement at a million dollars and efficiencies at 1.46. <coughs> Uh, together, that tallies up to the goal, which is in the upper left, which is $9.6 million. Um, that is still the goal that we're shooting for. It is possible that through the budget development process in Sacramento that that number can change. At this moment, it seems unlikely that that number would increase. And, but that, that's the most realistic number that we currently have, and therefore that's the number, the number that we're working toward. It's also important to recognize that this is the next uh, step in the budget for 2012 and 13, um, which we are still anticipating being a difficult year. So as we develop the budget, we're looking for a, a two-year plan still so that we can uh, ensure the districts uh, 
uh, finances are in order uh, through 2013. Okay, let's, uh, we have a request from uh, Victor Interiano, and again, if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, I apologize, to address the board on this issue. Good evening. Um, I would like to direct all of you to this very shiny document that Dr. Van Pelt has just produced. Um, and the very last column talks about efficiencies. There's one thing that's missing from there, and it's reduction of wasteful spending. So as Mr. Visky uh, pointed out a little while ago, uh, $35,000 is being apportioned uh, for use of the Pasadena Weston for uh, VP interviews. Now, my question is, what does the Weston in Pasadena have that Pasadena City College does not offer? We have beautiful facilities, we have top-notch food, and yet it's being taken away at a different area. Now, the thing I would like to bring up is that all of you passed it without a single question or even discussing it. But yet, where it concerns the student, fee, the student activity fee, all of you have questions, particularly, particularly you, Mr. Baum. You want to go through all the documents and look, nitpick on every single thing. But yet, where it concerns this particular issue, nothing. So my concern here is that when a student brings up a concern and you, know, you don't really discuss it, it's one of two things. You either don't care or you're just not paying attention. Thank you. Other questions about um, item uh, J on, or K, uh, excuse me, on the um, agenda, the Fiscal Services College budget update? Mr. Pack? I just have a clarification question, or I guess on, on the comment. Is it not customary that we provide accommodations for candidates that are flown in from, from various places and that in floating six positions, wouldn't we have to possibly provide accommodations for many candidates? I mean... Like a, a speech and debate tournament is not substantially less. Well, you expensive provide things. accommodations. You also have a place off campus to provide confidentiality of the applicants. Uh, that's uh, standard procedure in cities, standard procedures in PCC, and probably every place, uh, every public agency uh, doing interviews. So it's not unusual. I just wanted to like um, articulate that for the record. Good, so thank that you. <laughs> uh, other questions or comments? Um, okay. Well, here's the. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, right ahead, please. Yeah. So you're right ahead. Yeah, trying yeah. To tr we're doing. We're, uh, we're not on L yet. We're on K. Well, here's uh, a. <laughs> you know, um, I'll introduce uh, Lyle Engeldinger, the dean of human resources. This is the the we big. On, I'm sorry. We have to. Uh, we have to act on K, or there's no, no action. Uh, no action K required. was an informative. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. K was. Uh, I apologize. Item um, L: Human Resources, PARS, SERP report and action to approve SERP. Yeah. Um, Dean Engeldinger will give a report of the uh, SERP subscription, and uh, I'll turn it over to him. And in doing so, I'll say that this is a uh, an action item. It comes with the recommendation of the administration. Uh, to move forward and to authorize moving forward with the uh, the final approval for the SERP. Um, and I do want to also uh, point out that uh, in doing so, I want to especially uh, commend Lyle and everyone in human uh, resources uh, who really have been uh, burning the midnight oil since last fall uh, when we first... Uh, presented this and worked with the uh, PCCFA to uh, get this done and extend and then extend it to all empl employees. So uh, very, very appreciative of the board for its support, but especially there was so much uh, detail and hard work and information uh, that had to go into this uh, uh, very, very, very good result that we're reporting tonight. And so with that, I, I commend you, Lyle, and congratulate you and all your staff, and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Rocha. I'd like to introduce to you, if he's still awake, <laughs> <laughs> Eric O'Leary. He's a senior vice president with the Public Agency Retirement Services. He's here to help us uh, uh, with uh, responding to questions. Uh, before we uh, go forward, I'd like to make a very brief uh, set of comments. I think you have a... Uh, a one-sheet uh, document which we handed out to you earlier, uh, which gives the results of the enrollment period. And I'd like to go through those numbers with you uh, just, just very, very briefly. Uh, the enrollment period ended last Monday, May 16th. And uh, we, uh, we ended with uh, 87 um, 
actual retirement um, receipts during that period. Uh, it breaks down uh, as follows, 42 faculty, 10 academic management, uh, 27 CSEA represented employees, 20 issue represented employees, uh, three confidential employees, and four classified management and supervisors. Uh, the projected net savings, now this is using actual data from these uh, uh, potential retirees, uh, as Dr. Van Pelt reported, is $3,138,161 for the first year. And I, I should also mention that that, uh, that number is probably understated. Um, now, we would uh, uh, very much welcome any questions you may have about this, and we're prepared to go in great detail with you if that's what you would like. We would, as Dr. Roach has said, uh, present to you that this, uh, uh, this program for approval. Are there questions? Mr. Martin, you... Uh, well, I have a comment. I'd like to okay. commend Dr. Rocha for his tenacity in working through the retirement incentive. And in, in no less part, we need to also commend the units that, that you negotiated with who work through this part to enable to this to happen. So this was a large collective unit, you know, part of a lot of work and a lot of time where on again, off again, and between the units and some vision by our administrative team. And I'm just thrilled it worked out as well as it did what appears to be for everybody. And right. especially in the end, our students, right. because that cost savings ultimately means we're going to be able to offer more classes than we otherwise would not be able to allow. So I'm thrilled at the success. I'm appreciative to the units and the administration for working through it. Um, I'm just elated because I think our students are going to come out ahead. Other comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Baum? Again, just to piggyback on, on what uh, Mr. Martin said, that's uh, compliments both to uh, Lyle and, and Dr. Roach and, and the team. The, um, this, as, as Mr. Martin says, going back to the last item, we're going, we're going to minimize the number of course reductions in the coming year, even though we're facing severe budget cuts based on, on this budget. And this, this, is a, this is the largest part of that. And I, and I don't know if we really underscored the fact that compared to other districts up and down the state, our plan takes very few courses off, off the schedule. It actually maintains our ability to serve as many students as possible. Could, could I also mention Linda, Mc, Linda McGee and uh, Ms. Polo, who were uh, really outstanding participants starting over two years ago with this uh, particular project. So they, they deserve, uh, I think, great accolades. Other questions or comments? Okay, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. 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 Uh, Thank you, Eric. Moved by, by Dr. Fellow, seconded <laughs> by uh, Dr. Mann. Uh, comments, Dr. Rocha? I would just, uh, again, and, uh, and thank uh, our PARS <laughs> rep for staying so long. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, good work uh, to PARS, because everything that they, when they made their original presentation to us, and you accepted uh, them as the uh, agency, as the uh, company that would handle this for us, everything that they said would happen happened uh, in terms of their projections. So, uh, you know, so very, very appreciative of the parts. I did want to say that in reporting uh, what R Lyle has reported, that we have, are reporting the numbers only. We are not re releasing the names of the retirees um, until we can um, speak to the managers. Um, and uh, so that inform the managers first of who's retiring in, in their units. But uh, the approval that you may, just made is not contingent. The 87 retirees are moving forward, and uh, just wanted to mention that, and thank you again. And then just to speak to your, your plans, Dr. Rocha, a lot of managers are retiring. Are you planning to fill each and every one of those positions? No. 
So we're actually going to have a much leaner administrative leadership. As I've been saying all along, we will have a smaller administration and staff next year and a significantly reduced administration and staff expense and a increased expense in instruction. The uh, projected savings in year one, <coughs> excuse me, is $3,138,161. That's said to be a conservative um, estimate. So um, if that's the case, that'll be wonderful. And certainly that's the premise upon which I think as we proceeded on with this plan, and it seems to be working out uh, as uh, projected and as desired. So um, we voted a motion to make this. We have not yet voted, I don't think. No, uh, advisory vote? Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Item M. Uh, Mr. President? Yes. I, you slipped off a K faster than I. I always wish we could just briefly go back to K. Okay, sure. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, I can't see everybody out there, and I hope Vlad is still here. But um, there's been a lot of discussion about the vice presidential names. And I made a comment when we approved the search for the vice presidential positions that I conceptually understood those who were concerned about the number of names of vice presidents. But what we see on our budget layout in item K is non-filling up positions. And when you look down the list, you see where the brunt of that reduction in force is coming from, administrators, managers, and supervisors, 2.5 million dollars and what I think we as trustees trying to grasp the bigger picture have to recognize is and appreciate is that Dr. Rocha has a administra a streamlined administrative system and quite frankly as long as the administrative costs are going down and they're going down significantly and improving efficiencies in administration saving funds that allow us to offer more educational opportunities, I really don't care what you call them. You can call them vice presidents. It's fine with me. And if, if creating names that call their vice presidents get the right people here for the right efficiencies that allow us to reduce and streamline administration to allow more courses, then you have my enthusiastic support as part of the bigger picture. This budget, item K, reemphasizes exactly that streamline issue. And I, that to me is really important. Now there's a lot of details to come that has to support the numbers in each of the colorful boxes. But I'm appreciative of the format and I'm appreciative of the priorities that this budget reduction is emphasizing with the streamline of the administration taking the first cut of it, trying to preserve it, the academic courses as much as possible. I Good. think that needs to be stated. Uh, thank you very much for quite stating it quite clearly. <laughs> Moving on now to item M on yes. the agenda. Yes, and calling uh, Dean Cole, uh oh, I'm sorry, uh, you're not facilities. <laughs> Thank uh, God. <laughs> uh, you're facilities. I would be okay. Disaster. This is actually a streamlined item yes. uh, <laughs> because we were going to uh, present the emergency resolution today, but we just today received information from the county that advised us that we have to put that out to bid. So in effect, this item is moot. Uh, okay. today and we will be bringing at uh, next meeting uh, an authorization to go out for public bid. Uh, Rick, is that? That's absolutely true. So just one quick question. As I read this, it, you, the recommendation had been to purchase uh, trailers. It would, be, it would be less expensive than to rent them for three or four years. And yes. It, so uh, the county did advise us today that, um, uh, that we would have to go out to public bid. And in doing so, we will do the two steps that we did in the, in the analysis for lease versus purchase, <coughs> mm -hmm. so that we can we can present the option of whether we buy or whether we lease. Uh, you're absolutely correct that a three-year lease is equivalent to the purchase of the of the units, and therefore years four and any anything beyond that would be uh, free to us essentially. But we, next time we will have the authorization to bid for the portable units. Okay. Moving on into item N, uh, 
IPRO annual ARCC report, et cetera. In introducing uh, Crystal, uh, the ARC <coughs> report actually, uh, I uh, asked uh, Crystal to uh, streamline this item. Uh, and uh, so we will be presenting the uh, Ed Master Plan degree and CTE uh, information in June or at a later date when we can do kind of an annual uh, wrap up because uh, there's some more crunching to do on that. But the ARC report is the uh, accountability report for the California Community Colleges, and it is a law that each year we uh, present this report to you. And so um, I'm grateful to Crystal for the work she's done on this, and uh, she is going to present ARC. Thank you, Dr. Rocha, Board of Trustees. As usual, I'm delighted to present this report to you. I provided just a few slides tonight just to make this as simple as possible, a little background information. This is the fifth year of the ARC report. There are eight performance measures, all of which are reported in percentages. And as Dr. Rocha just mentioned, it is legally required that I present it to you tonight, and then I will just report that back to the Chancellor's Office that I did my job. First one I like to do is I like to provide just a bit of context on all of the eight indicators. Actually, and you're only going to see seven up here because the eighth one is the non-credit indicator. What I put up here is how PCC looks compared to the state overall. So the yellow column is PCC, and that lovely navy blue column is the state rate. And as you can see, in most cases, PCC is above the state rate on each of the indicators. The next slide is really ugly, but uh, we like to give this to you. It is a comparison of PCC to local community college single districts. I do give you this every year, and it's, it's, it's cumbersome, but I know you'll all take it home tonight and read it carefully and get back to me. <laughs> Nod. That's good. Okay. And then this one I gave to you for the first time last year. It actually breaks out the first indicator, which just talks about transfer and our transfer late to baccalaureate granting institutions. The first ARC indicator is called SPAR, and it actually includes just about everything that they could possibly throw in it, which is degrees, certificates, transfer, transfer directed, transfer prepared. But I know that the board likes to look at how we're doing transfer-wise, and I wanted to make sure I showed you this one. As you can see, in uh, 9-10, we just took a tad dip in our transfer percentage rate, and that was expected because in the spring of 2010, the CSUs kind of stopped accepting transfers. We're, we're not expecting that to happen this year, and we expect that to go back up. And I said this was brief. <laughs> That's right. So if you have any questions, I'll entertain them. Whoa. I had a question. <laughs> So in, in past years, the ARCTAD has been helpful in identifying some trends that we, things were doing well, but also some areas in, in career and technical education where our performance isn't. What, what, what are the lessons we've taken from this year's ARC report as trends to be proud of and trends to pay a little closer attention to? Well, once again, our success rate in career and technical education has gone up, and we've worked very hard on that rate, and we've seen continuous improvement. We are also probably one of the best in the state in persistence, the fall to fall persistence of our students. We do very well in that every year and we continue to do well. Once again, I would say that where we need to focus our attention is on the basic skills improvement rate. We are not where we need to be on that and I think we have some really nice programs coming through, some acceleration programs, some module supplement education programs that I think are gonna help us address that. That's what I was looking for, thank you. Other questions? Uh, Dr. Mann? Yeah, I, I have a, a brief comment. Uh, I, I think that these numbers look very, very good. Um, and if, as I'm sure the trustees know, this is, on the, this is on the Chancellor's website. Is that not correct? So if you want to, you can, yeah, then you can see all of these numbers and so much. This is a very good summary of uh, what's there. I am concerned, though, that if our vocational course completion is going up, we still, that's the only area where we have consistently been below the state rate, uh, and also we're a little bit below on the ESL uh, improvements. So uh, this is the, do you say this is the fourth year for this data, fifth? This is actually the fifth year, and 
One thing I've noticed over the last five years is that every year the data gets better. And particularly with the ESL rate and the credit basic skills, I think we're going to see that even get better for us because they've been doing some reworking of how we actually report that. It's a new data element that they've been really working hard on to kind of standardize it across the state. It wasn't before. So one thing that I notice when I do it every year, particularly in that table I showed you, you would think that all I would have to do is add a new line and take out a line, but it's never like that. I actually have to go through and replace all the numbers because from year to year for every college, all the numbers change from the years before. So I think that it's getting better. It's not perfect, but I do believe that they say in the report this year they expect by 2012-2013 report we'll see far more consistent numbers in basic skills improvement and ESL improvement. Well, that's very that's very good to know. I I guess my comment is though I the first year it came out then there's these different groups you're compared to. The first year we were like the best in our group in almost everything again except vocational course completion. And even though we're improving, we're still we're still low there. Um, so I, at some point, I'd like to have a report on what we're doing to get these these numbers up. The other thing I would like to say, and this came out of the Students uh, Success Task Force, it's just a discussion item, but it was at a public meeting. Uh, there is a, a proposal to have performance-based funding using the ARC measurements. So it's extremely important, I think that we really concentrate, as you say, on making sure that our numbers are the best possible and identifying whatever we can do to get these, get these numbers up. Now, the existing proposal gives a phase-in time, and it may not be funded, but a lot of people were very receptive to that because the, the data system is already in place and people under, understand it. Uh, as long as it's kind of just a picture of what we're doing, I think it's people are not really con that's, uh, concerned about it, but if we suddenly I have partial funding at risk because these numbers are not moving one way or the other, then I think it becomes much more serious. So I know you have, are doing every, everything you can to make sure we have the best possible numbers, but I would just like to encourage you to uh, do better. <clears throat> to do better. <laughs> and, I, and as I indicated, I would like to have a report sometime in the, in the future on, on what we're doing to continue improvement in vocational course and ESL, and finally, basic does not have a K on it. Sorry. What? I'll fix it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you. Um, yes, in fact, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that Crystal is supervising now is a um, ramped up program review. Um, and of course, we now instituted the Institutional Effectiveness Committee, uh, which is developing uh, metrics for measuring exactly that where we are and, and you know and where we're going and uh, we completely uh, you know uh, take in your comment and you shall uh, have that report in detail there's no re action we're to take on this. no it's just a, uh, it's a it's an informative but it's required by legislation okay thanks Kristen. item um, O instruction additions and deletions <coughs> to credit curriculum discussion of possible action uh, this actually um, is a um, uh, it's an important item, uh, but shouldn't be a controversial item. It uh, comes from the uh, I think I saw Joe here about yeah, a day ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is Joe still here? Oh, there he is. <laughs> um, and uh, well, Joe, if you, if you wouldn't mind taking half a second and just explaining this item because it's it's just courses, but it just gives us an opportunity to recognize you for the work that you're doing in, on uh, the curriculum and instruction committee. May, may I just do a quick introduction, okay. Dr. Rocha? Uh, there's the, the, what's really important here is the uh, the associate of arts uh, transfer and the associate of arts uh, in uh, sciences degree that are tied to the SB 1440. And this is what uh, uh, both uh, Mr. Footner and Mr. Duran uh, are going to speak to. And it's very, very exciting news. And it's been led by the Academic Senate. And uh, that'll be there. That's a quick introduction. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Dr. Rocha, uh, President Thomas Thompson, and the members of the board here, and all visitors and attendees. This is a very exciting opportunity. And as chair of curriculum and instruction here, uh, faculty committee uh, with the Academic Senate, I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague in the division of uh, counseling area, uh, Armando Duran. And Armando had the responsibility and did the good work of shepherding forward 
not one, not two, not three, but four what are referred to as SB 1440 compliant degrees. Following in on what Crystal was presenting and what Dr. Mann was discussing about student success rates, I think this is directly linked to the Vision 90 plan having to do with improving transfer rates. The nutshell of it is, before taking any of your fire, uh, is that what we have made is a fast track. We have made a clear plan for students working with the Cal State system working with faculty, with counseling, and now there's an opportunity for them to present a degree that will be directly transferable to a number of uh, our transfer institutions within the Cal State system. And I'm gonna let uh, Armando present the particulars of that, SB 1440. Thank you. Uh, again, good evening, everyone. Um, again, we're very excited for the simple reason, as a counselor especially, um, that these degrees will help students transfer in a more timely fashion. Um, Currently we have four. The first four that were proposed by the Chancellor's Office. So our goal is to keep pace with the, with the Chancellor's Office. Currently I, I believe four colleges have submitted their degrees and we hope to be in the top percentile. Uh, that's a promise, we will be. Um, the degrees are mathematics, communications, psychology, and sociology. Uh, as previously mentioned, these degrees are, will also provide guaranteed admissions to some of the local uh, universities, CSUs. Um, and just to give you a little background, the, it's a committee consisting of counselors, faculty, staff, um, we also, the articulation officer, and through the support of the CNI, the Academic Senate. So it's a collaborative effort. So it's not just me putting these, these degrees together. So our hope that, it, that we, again, continue to keep pace with the degrees that are being proposed by the Chancellor's Office and bring them for, for uh, approval. All right. Are there questions? Uh, Ms. Martin? Bye. I'm really ha delighted with this. I have no questions on this, and I'm happy to support it. And I want to use the opportunity to put a bug in the committee's ear. It's two things I've heard in the last few months. One is the number, one of the highest, if not the highest, transfer vocation or transfer emphasis is business. And if that's true, it seems like the, the faster we can get something in line for business, the more students we're helping sooner. So I'm just putting the bug sure. in your ear. Number two that I heard supporting that comment is that even in the 1440 alignment where you, you are guaranteed a spot, you're not always guaranteed a spot in the business school or the business curriculum program of the Cal State that is legally has to accept you. And I'm not knowing, but surmising that if we had such an associate degree, that may help our business students get some of the coveted spots in, in the Cal States and other business schools that they're trying to transfer. So, so I'm really, I know you got a lot of other competing interests, but I thought I got to use the opportunity to put a bu the, the plug in for business. These uh, TMCs, transfer uh, curricula models, are being put forward uh, by the Chancellor's Office, uh, working oh, okay. with different faculty. So they're still in the process of rolling these out. These so, were the first four correct. that were developed. We already have a studio and art history, for example, that's being put forward. It's being vetted so right now. I need now. to lobby Jeff over here. <laughs> that's right. More than I need to lobby you that's that right. maybe you could roll out business a little sooner. So okay. this, is, this is an ongoing activity. All right, thank and, you. And if I, if I may, uh, just I want to read a, a paragraph from a letter that was uh, presented to the Chancellor's Office on the 13th of May. This is signed by Lawrence Pitts, who is the Provost and Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs, and by Daniel Simmons, who is the head of the Academic Council for the University of California system. Uh, it's a key player who has not yet fully been moved into the 1440 compliant zone. But now I'd, I'd like you to read this. We would also like to take this opportunity to reiterate our support for the development of the associate degree pathway. To the extent that students complete the TMC-based associate degrees, we anticipate better prepared students applying to the university, especially in majors where some campuses do not currently demand lower division major preparation as a requirement for admission. Furthermore, to the extent that new community college freshmen are unsure of the segment or campus in which they will transfer, the associate <laughs> degree will provide an early and clear roadmap. While conversations are ongoing at the university, we anticipate that we'll respond to AS bill, uh, Assembly Bill 2302, which was related to 1440, 
by identifying several areas where UC can guarantee eligibility for a comprehensive review of admission. As UC faculty committees do their work, we will continue to update you. So this is a very positive development, and I think that we'll be able to see greater student success for transfer into degree programs without wasting our time and money and their time and money. Uh, Mr. Baum, then Dr. Mann. Sure. First, I'd like to move the uh, approval of the, uh, the curricular changes. And then, and is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. And then number two, just I want to just reemphasize that this puts PCC at the head of the pack in the state. There's only maybe one other college that has actually moved so uh, uh, efficiently and effectively. College of the Desert, I believe, is we, we the, have the largest number. Oh, oh, we have the largest number. Yeah, oh, okay. We will have the largest number. Yeah, they're evidently most colleges are saying we're going to do one and right. see what happens. Our goal is to get all four. Whatever the okay. chancellor's office submitted, we. Okay, I'll brag about it next time I'm at the uh, Board of Governors meeting. But this puts us really at the head of the pack, and, it, and it's, it's going to be such a great service to students because they will be guaranteed. Our challenge now is going to be making sure the CSUs live up to their commitment because a lot of them are saying, uh, you know, we're impacted in certain uh, uh, programs so that even though we have the students who've done everything they need to do, there, there, there are some challenges in ensuring that they have the spots to transfer into. And, uh, and so, and there's several CSUs that say they're impacted in all, <coughs> all fields, including the ones that are men mentioned here. So if you want to go to Cal State uh, Fullerton or Cal State uh, San Diego State or others, it will be a, it's going to take an additional uh, push forward to make sure our students can, can I, use this to do I that. If I can just add to that, that this is, an, this is truly an ongoing right. uh, 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 articulation game. We're, we're really pushing forward on this and we're seeing where campuses are adopting it, what changes can be made in the future. So this is a dynamic process and not simply a static set of degrees that we'll be offering. Absolutely. Okay, Dr. Mann and then Mr. Martinez. Yes, I have a, a question about, it doesn't have to do with the trans transfer curriculum, it's about one of the other curricular changes, do you want to wait until that's done? But I certainly want to raise a question before we vote on it. Or should I go, go ahead, ahead and raise, it raise the question? Okay, we are deleting the program in performing and communication arts, television, radio, television operations, technology. How does this affect the interns that we have at KPCC? It says that this, there's no longer any entry level jobs in this field, but as my understanding, we have 12, 14, 16 interns and they do work in technical radio. Uh, I, Are we I, cutting off our nose here? I don't know if Dr. Einwarn is here, but if not, I can right. respond to that if you'd like. Uh, the, the, what they've done is, uh, through the CNI process, they've gone back and they've deleted this program and they've, mo they've uh, modified other existing uh, uh, programs in order to uh, provide for the needs of the students, okay. which, which include the internships that you're talking about, All right. Dr. As, as, long, as long as we aren't you know, losing those interns. No, okay. absolutely not. Mr. Martinez? Uh, I just want to let you know that from the perspective of the, of the Academic Senate, we really appreciate the work that Joe Footner has done as chair as, of the CNI committee and that Armando has done as the chair of the ad hoc committee on the Student Transfer Reform Act. Uh, these are just, as, as you pointed out, the first four uh, degrees. Business is in the works, and this has been a, a long process over the course of the year, and I just wanted to acknowledge their hard work. Good, thank you. Right. Other questions or comments? Um, Okay, it's been moved and seconded that uh, we approve this. Any further discussion? Advisory vote? Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we're much. on Thank to you. information technology, mm -hmm. item P. Okay, we'll call uh, Bob and Justin up. This is a very, very brief report. Uh, you now uh, know Justin. Uh, Justin Sui, who is our uh, IT project uh, management leader, uh, they've been uh, deep into the uh, uh, agenda for upgrading IT vis-a-vis uh, -vis the deliverable sheet that was presented to you um, some time ago, actually uh, uh, two months ago, and uh, they've been at work. And I asked them to very, very briefly, since we started the uh, summer registration period, and we'll be heading into the fall registration period uh, to give you an update, which goes to the idea that it's, uh, it's working. 
All right, well, listen, it'll be very short because the computer just went down for some reason. But what I will do is I will, yeah, yeah. I will, uh, just draw, I will bring to the board's attention two things. Uh, in your packets, you have uh, a stapled group of papers, which includes a uh, two-page uh, report uh, in terms of where we are right now. It includes uh, a list of our certica certification stakeholders, uh, a checklist in terms of our certification checklist that we've used, uh, for the uh, summer uh, registration process and uh, using that as we go forward in the fall. And then uh, the uh, May 12th version of the, of the IT project tracker. In the PowerPoint presentation that you were looking at, it's very short, I'll just briefly say uh, that the project leaders are the folks that are, that are mentioned there. This continues to be the group that is leading this, uh, assisted by our consultant, Justin Choi. And I also wanted to add the, cert the uh, certification stakeholder group because they are actively engaged in everything that is happening. From a, from a progress to date point of view, our project tracker ebbs and flows. Currently, we're at 53 projects of different things that are being worked on. Uh, we have developed the certification process. We have this thing called conference room pilots where we are actually bringing uh, all of the uh, processes into a, a conference room or a piloted place where uh, both the end users and our technicians work side by side. Uh, we have a new uh, pre-production proof, uh, proof of design and concept. Uh, uh, Justin wanted me to point out uh, very specifically that the long-awaited uh, rollout of Schedule 25 and Resource 25 in terms of the uh, uh, use of our facilities is uh, finally now uh, on the docket to be rolled out uh, uh, in August. That's been like a five-year um, process that we're working on. Uh, we're, and then we're rewriting a number of existing online faculty services and, and prototypes and what have you as we go forward here. Uh, also, in, in, very important, we've merged our MIS and instructional computing operations under a single information technology arm. Uh, we've relocated all of those uh, personnel and uh, facilities to the uh, library building, our LL building. And uh, we now have a, a much greater college commitment and resolve to improving all of our MIS and academic computing services. As we go forward into the future, we have several opportunities and challenges. Uh, we're going to work hard to sustain all these improvements. We're going to refine the processes that we've developed thus far. Uh, we are going to remind ourselves and bear in mind that this is a legacy system that was developed in 1982. And therefore, there's only so much that we can do with the technology before we move forward into a new enterprise resource plan. Uh, we have to recognize that there's been multiple developers over the years that have worked on all these things, 70 plus what we call bolt-ons onto this system. So my point is it's incredibly complex. It's not necessarily easy. I've learned a great deal in the last eight weeks as I've been uh, heavily engaged in this process. Uh, finally, our business process revision and implementation teams, we are creating those teams. Uh, we are building those teams in preparation for a new enterprise resource plan. It's a, it's a very integral part of who we are and what we are as we move forward into our new uh, technology future. And all this is about uh, delivering to the new VP of Information Technology uh, a working information technology infrastructure for the 2011-2012 uh, period so he or she has the time to really begin to explore uh, what the best enterprise resource planning uh, pro uh, processes for us and to move forward. Um, and then, of course, all this in support of a technology master plan that will support the EMP. So, um, quickly, summer registration going very well, uh, having a few bugs, but for the most part going well. Uh, we are working towards a smoother fall registration, uh, trouble-free uh, registration, um, and you can read some of the other items there in terms of uh, some of the key processes that we are working on. And so I guess the bottom line to all this is that uh, the technology is as ready as it possi possibly can be under the circumstances of 1982 technology and, and uh, developers who worked on it over the years. And uh, we will experience these challenges going forward. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But unequivocally, we are in the best position that we have been in a long time in support of technology on this campus. And that's with uh, great thanks to the Board of Trustees and Dr. Rocher for your combined leadership. Thank you. Questions? Um, okay. So there's no action where we're required to take those on it. Well, thank you, sir. No. Just uh, wanted to, uh, you know, update you and make sure that you knew that we were uh, um, 
putting Justin to good use. I would just ask Justin to just say a word or two, the trustees. Um, Justin, today's, uh, what is it, May 18th? What is in place in May 18th? Uh, what is different and better uh, in, uh, according to your assessment that didn't exist two months ago when you started this project? Yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, um, trustees and uh, every attendees. Um, I think from uh, uh, our perspective for the last two, week, uh, two months, uh, Bob has pointed out a lot of things we have achieved. But really, um, at the bottom line on all these activity is building a foundation, strengthening the foundations, and have the campus involved and integrated with the MIS team, both feeding the requirements and uh, as well as getting the feedbacks. I think that level of communication and uh, integrated working as a team. I see a lot of people here that has contributed to the process. Crystal, Cynthia, uh, Dave, Stu has been a very integral part of these uh, uh, testing inputs, uh, submission of issues. I, I think it's a campus-wide effort. Um, it's a very uh, focused and target effort and also kind of we bind the MIS into a responsibility to kind of turn around and uh, provide whatever that's necessary on it. And uh, um, I think Crystal's reports indicates how important data is to run an organization like this. And I think only when the MIS is, uh, have a strong foundation and it can have a process that have a, a, a fluid process that everybody can uh, work together, build the requirements, help them prioritize their precious resources, I think that's where we can generate the greatest results for the campus. Okay. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I can just add very quickly, uh, Justin has been amazing to work with. Uh, he has really helped us quite a bit, so it was an excellent choice. Good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Thanks. Okay, let's move on to item Q. Um, Adopt resolution number 473 for method of payment and word limitation for candidate statements, discussion of possible action. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think the uh, like resolution move, speaks for itself. Is motion, I'd like to move resolution 473, which sir. provides a 200 word limit and that the candidate pays for it, him or her still. Second. <laughs> Move and second. Any discussion on this item? Advisory vote? Aye. Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Uh, we've done item R. Uh, we're now on then to item S. Uh, public hearing regarding initial bargaining proposal for 2010-2011 from the Pasadena City College Police Officer Association to the Pasadena Curie Community College District. Um, this is the hearing. It's therefore now open. Anybody wishing to address the board with respect to this matter? Not appearing, we'll have to declare the hearing closed. Uh, is there action to be taken on this end or is there... That's it. Uh, T. Oh. Yes. Wrong T. Yes. 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 Oh. Okay. That's on the... Now we're on T. Okay. So we're now on to item T. On the agenda, Association Community College Trustees nomination of Kathy Wee for a faculty award, discussion with possible action. Uh, somebody want to make the presentation on this so we have a little bit of uh, background? Uh, yes, for, uh, for this I would uh, um, ask uh, Trustee Wa to, uh, you know, uh, present the item and uh, she was very, very helpful in, in getting this. And then of course, uh, Dean Young, Ted's out there. Uh, I, don't know, I don't think Kathy's here, but uh, Kathy's in uh, Ted's division, and he's been uh, on top of this. So. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Um, when we were back in Washington, I had a chance to attend the um, Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, and, um, and they mentioned the awards that they have for ACCT, but one of the things that they said was they don't get, they rarely get nominations for any Asian Pacific Islander um, so what I did was uh, we had a nation, the President's Asian Advisory Committee, and so I presented it to, to them, and then um, I turned it over to the Asian American faculty here at PCC, the faculty and staff, and um, they unanimously um, nominated Kathy, Dr. Kathy Wei for this um, 
this honor, and um, they wanted to keep it a secret from her until after tonight, hope, you know, for hoping for a good result here, but um, it did leak out. But a lot of the information they got had to be gotten under the covers, um, and it was really hard. Um, and in the end, we found out that she thought we were asking all these questions because she thought we were trying to get rid of her program. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I want to point out a, f a few things. I have worked with Kathy um, quite a lot and um, on community issues, and she's very well known in the um, Chinese American uh, community for her work with the Mandarin language programs, and she's um, been very instrumental in uh, involving the community and furthering um, uh, the language learning of Mandarin here in PCC. And one of the things, a uh, couple of things, she's she's kind of put PCC on the map in that we are, I believe, the only community college that has an HSK certification, which is the certification of fluency for the Mandarin language. So we are an H HSK testing site because of uh, Dr. Wei's efforts. And um, as I was going through her biography, two things that were, well, one of the things that was really most, in, um, I think, uh, really impressive to me was um, the outcome of, of alumni from PCC who, because of taking uh, Mandarin language under Dr. Wei's uh, program, <coughs> went on to become very influential business people in uh, working in the Chinese community, so one actually working in mainland China, and he's an Anglo-American, but he learned Chinese, and another is an African-American um, student who uh, went on to become a very successful businessman here in Pasadena and actually is working on the foundation with Dr. Sugimoto. But I wanted to um, see if Dr. Young, um, who is uh, Kathy Wei's dean, wanted to come up and, and add some things since he was very instrumental in providing information. And then as Ted is uh, coming to the podium, of course, I, I strongly support this. And Ted and Kathy have been uh, really uh, at the heart of an effort um, <coughs> on moving us forward as a truly global community college. They've been working on the uh, new study abroad programs, ESL programs um, in, uh, in China. So um, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a well deserved nomination, Ted. Well, I, I will be very brief and simply say that Kathy Wei is an extraordinary person in terms of as an educator and as a leader for her program. Uh, she has put us on the map. We have an incredibly good reputation among the, the Chinese community in, in Southern California. She um, sees to it that we get publicity for in the Chinese media. Um, there have been numerous times that we've had reporters coming on our campus because of the state of our program. It also <coughs> relates to our F1 visa students, our international students. Uh, we have a lot coming from China in part because of the great reputation that we have and that comes back to all the PR that she does. And besides that, she um, seems to do the job of about five different people all at once. And <laughs> I always say she just makes me look good because she has all these new proposals and new ideas and they all seem to be pretty wonderful. Well, I think it's very timely that we do this too. When we were back in Washington, uh, Linda Waugh and I attended uh, a uh, program in the State Department uh, where they were promoting uh, an exchange of students between the United States and, uh, and China. So this is a very timely uh, recommendation, I think. So, uh, Is there a motion to approve? So move. With second. enthusiasm, right? With great enthusiasm. <laughs> is there a second? Second. Okay, any further comments or? Uh, Mr. Pack? Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Fingers crossed for it. Can I add just one more thing? Because of uh, Dr. Wei, there's all, there's, um, PCC is going to host an event on calligraphy and Tai Chi on Wednesday in the quad, next Wednesday in the quad at 12 o'clock. So we're sending that information out to the community, and I hope everyone enthusiastically supports that. Okay. Uh, we now are on to future board meeting dates. Wednesday, June the 1st, regular meeting at 7 o'clock, closed session beginning at 5.30. Um, Wednesday, June 15th, we've listed a study session, but it may be a combination of study session and some action um, at 6 p.m. Where is that one going to be? Uh, uh, here. here. Okay. Uh, here, right? Uh, yeah. Here. Okay. <coughs> Now, uh, future agenda items. I think uh, Dr. Mann had one. Yes, I would like to put on AB 684 as a future agenda item. Uh, briefly, this is uh, 
legislation that was sponsored by the Community College League and is being carried by a former San Diego trustee. What it would do is the California Voter right, Voting Right Act requires that if uh, members are elected at large that, they're, that they be able to prove that they are not disenfranchising any community. Um, and it, I think the feeling is that almost all the districts that elect at large are going to have to go to what they call wards, where they are elected just to represent a part of that. This election, if and there's a prior law that says that in order to change the uh, from an at large to a trustee area election, you have to have a it has to be approved by the voters. Uh, this legislation would provide that the uh, local boards could switch from an at large to a trustee area election or could change their number of trustees by uh, requesting permission from the Board of Governors, and the Board of Governors then could approve it. This, if this passes, this will literally save millions of dollars when you realize there are 73 districts, and I think the majority of them uh, do not have local election by <coughs> trustee area elections. So I would like to put it on the agenda so we can discuss it and maybe uh, take a position supporting it, because although it does not affect us directly, it does affect districts up and down the state. And Mr. Martin was at the redistricting uh, session at the Triple CT conference. Do you have anything you want to add well, I now? I think or? I agree that it does make it a definitely more efficient and a more appropriate method than what is being used currently. Okay, uh, that will be on uh, the future agenda soon. Yeah, and, and the sooner we get this one on, the better, because they, what they're asking for is letters of support. Right. Yeah. Other future agenda items? Anything else to be brought up? And we are adjourned. <laughs>